Viewer discretion is advised. I always felt like they would pick on me. And so I told myself I wanted to be better than them. I want to be on a stage where I look down on them. And that's what motivated me. Mandate. Welcome to Mandate, where we navigate fresh perspectives and nothing is off the table. Tonight's guest was born in Windy Wellington, uh, but for many years has resided and lived in Tamaki Makaru, South Okilani, and Manarua, Rua Hard, but now resides in Australia, Brisbane. She is a wahine tour, also an entrepreneur who has started her own unique uh, footwear uh, called Stavias. And so she's traveled excessively all around the world pr 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 uh, promoting her brand and also her shoe, her shoe business as well. But more so, she's an amazing mother amazing uh, wife, uh, but also she has an amazing story to share. Please put your hands together for the wonderful Gustavia Louis. Maro lava, maro lava soy fua. Gustavia, thank you so much for coming on the podcast um, tonight. And so just before we kind of get into the Talanoa, just want to, to if you, from your own words, in terms of how it all kind of Panned out how it all began and just the, the humble beginnings and so forth, and also the the shoes, Stavias. And if you can give us a little bit of a, an insight of how it all began for you. Oh, okay. first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight. And um, but yeah, how did it all start? I actually, I will say, like, before we started, like, before it became like an idea, and that Charles and S have actually. They were there from the very, very start when it was just an idea on paper all the way through. So they've like literally watched the journey front row seats kind of thing. But I am, um, I've always had big feet. And, um, <laughs> that was a problem for me. Like I think in intermediate, I was um, like size 11. And so, like, shoes didn't, the women's shoes didn't go up to 11 then. So, um, yeah, that's when I first felt the real struggle of actually having big feet. And so I carried on through for my life, and I just could never find, like, shoes that I like. And, you know, back then, obviously, I was quite young, and um, I'm into fashion and that. So the fact that I couldn't wear anything other than, like, Havaiana jandals, I hated that. And then um, I worked for Working Income. I was there for um, like a whole decade. And I could, like my style was very limited because of the shoes. And I hated that. So I just um, started, I actually went and did a course on money management. And I did that because we wanted to buy a house. And I learned about business, like business, that was the first time business ever came up. And I was like, oh, shucks, I might actually do this. I was thinking that I'll go and import shoes from around the world, big size, and then bring them here and sell them here. And so, um, yeah, I went along with that idea, did that course, and then I did a, I think it's called Small Business Management course. Mm. And then I decided that I was going to start travelling to try and find anybody who sold the big shoes. So... Um, but that's how it all got started. Like, that was my drive, was that I hated what was available. Mm. There was never any nice shoes, never any nice heels. And I love wearing heels. Like, I always wear heels. Probably not today, but back then. <laughs> <laughs> I used to wear heels all the time. So it was it just I hated the fact that I couldn't wear heels and I had to dress according to the shoes, which I didn't like. So that was really my motivation and my drive to try and see if I can get nice shoes for myself and then... I found out all these other girls have big feet, and I was like, "Oh, might as well." Yeah, she's for all of us then. <laughs> well, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. It's like you found a, you found a need not only for yourself, but you felt like, "Oh, there's a need there, so there's a, there's a problem that needs to be solved." And then you come up with a solution. And you're right. There's there's a, an amazing niche of, of of other women, not even just women, but also men, who are looking for that kind of the, those sizes. The and so yeah, so what an amazing journey. But in terms of the journey and, and, and the shoes and, and the branding and so forth. How's it, how has it been for you? Because I, I can understand the, the, the beginning, the, the humble beginnings, but in terms of getting it off the ground, how has it been for you in terms of mentally, but not only mentally, but also physically? Um, I think at the start it was really, it was really cool actually. Like I really enjoyed the process at the beginning. Um, I was working full time all throughout the research stage. Mm -hmm. um, all the way to launch I worked full time and I would travel like on annual leave and 
stuff like that. And I actually really enjoyed the process. I enjoyed getting it up and running. And um, because I didn't have a lot of money to outsource a lot of things. So I just kind of like learned. So a lot of the time I would learn like what a website is, how to get it up and running, how to like edit the pages and stuff like that. I couldn't afford to pay people. And back then I feel like it was like very expensive to yeah. pay people. Like nowadays you can pay 20 bucks to somebody on, I don't know, Upwork and they'll do it. Mm. But back then it wasn't like that. So um, I just had to learn it myself. Mm. And I found that not a lot of people understood the language, like website language back then. So uh, that's what I had to do. And I really enjoyed it, actually. I, funnily enough, yeah, no, I did. I really enjoyed the whole process all the way through. And then um, to, there was, like, a lot of hype around it. When I first launched, like, I launched in January, but it wasn't until about, <clears throat> excuse me, March, I think. Um, March or April. What year? Um, oh, 2016. <coughs> Wow. Yeah, oh. so 2016 was when we actually went live. We were supposed to go live in July of 2015, and that's when I resigned from my job. But my um, factory switched up last minute, and um, it's kind of normal now. Like, when I look back, it's like, oh, yeah, that's normal China behavior. But, um, <laughs> like, now, oh, yeah, so we launched, like, six months later. Like, in that six months, I had to find a new supplier and um, build another relationship with them and get things up and running, mm. so... Um, it was really, really good. I really enjoyed it all the way through. I think it's been what? 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21, three. It's been seven years since we've been up and running. Yeah. I first started researching in 2010. Wow. So it's been like 13 years of this whole <laughs> business thing. And I think I, I've learned a couple of things. But towards like just I found that in the journey of business, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, like the more you achieve, the um, tougher the battles become, like the mental battles. So you like set out to achieve um, certain goals and you achieve that and then all of a sudden you're like facing new, um, bigger problems. and big. But I find that a lot of the problems that you face when you reach these different levels of um, success, if you want to call it that, is um, the mental the mental battles that you have um, with yourself, really. Yeah. So um, I think just more recently, I've uh, like the last couple of years, actually, like we moved to Brisbane, we got it up and running in Brisbane, which is cool. It's still running, like um, still ongoing in that, but it's just been me as a person, as the founder, um, battling, you know, certain mental battles just to so, sort of push through to the next level once you achieve it's, it's like those games you know like you gotta go through a certain game and you know um, climb certain things and then you unlock the next level business I feel is exactly the same mm, in terms of mentally yeah. physically um <laughs> Yeah, I need to <laughs> stop eating. <laughs> I need to stop eating. Um, but I think because I, I do business full time, so I just cool. find time to, if I don't train, it's not because I have I don't have time, it's just because I didn't want to that day. So um, Me. you have to work on that bit a little. But <laughs> overall, it's been honestly a blessing. It was one of the best decisions that I made in my life. Um, to do that because it has contributed um, like to me to my growth as a person as a mom as a wife um, as a businesswoman and yeah I, 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 it's been good it, it's tough oh shucks it's definitely not for the week I'll tell you that <laughs> yeah you can't um, you can't be in business and um, survive in business you know for this long if you're not um, mentally strong or constantly working to make yourself mentally strong. Mm. So, um, yeah. Oh, darn. Speaking speak like a true entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, it is hard out, hard out. Yeah, sure. So, so, man. It, you know, you've just given us a snapshot of the journey, and you make it sound so easy just because of how exciting it was for you and um, how passionate you were about it. But like you said, like me and Essie, so, sort of saw it from the beginning and seen the journey along the way and we know it wasn't easy we've yeah. seen you like there was times where i knew um when things didn't um happen like probably a 
change in the factory over in China and you had to make some changes, but you did everything off your back. It's not like you had heaps of money to start mm, off with. And, yeah. and so it'll be cool just to get an insight of um, some of those trialing times because, um, yeah, because I think, because I know you personally, but I think you're such a, a amazing, resilient uh, woman um, that, um, yeah, that, a lot of people and young people, especially from South Auckland, especially from those who are uh, similar journey, and we'll get into your journey later on, but um, they can look at you and go, yeah, I got no excuse. I can be like her because she's, she's running the race. And so it'd be cool to, to see some of those journey, <laughs> that, um, hear some of those stories where it's like, man, you got nothing else. You got no other resources, but only God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, yes. what was one of the Remember stories? Those? <laughs> <laughs> those ones. Oh, my gosh. I, in um, I'll tell you this one story. Like, in 2013, I think. Yeah, it was 2013. I was due to go to Vegas in January for footwear trade show. And so everyone knew, like, the year before that I was going to go to um, – Vegas, I was going to go to Vegas, it was so funny, because I had all this money paid out, I had all this money in my bank account, and um, somehow, come to the time to pay my fee, I had like no money, and it was like the beginning of January, oh, we had a family reunion that December, January, so all my mum's family was over, and so um, I was just like swiping my card, I don't know, I must have thought that there was like unlimited funds in there, because <laughs> at the end I was like, damn, all the money's gone, I got no... Um, I got no um, fear to go, but I absolutely refused to not not go. Like I was like, no, 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 I'm gonna go. And so I, um, oh, S told me, oh, we're doing the 21 day fast. You know, they do the fast at the beginning of the year. Like our church used to do it all the time. And um, I was like, oh yeah, I think I'll just join it then. <laughs> I think I got no other option because it's either that. And like I didn't want to get into debt um, for it. Yeah. And um, and not only that, I wanted to go, but I didn't want to go by myself. So not only did I have no money to pay for myself, I had no money to pay for myself and my cousin who I wanted to take with me. And it was so funny. As we fasted, or I fasted, for 21 days. And I remember on, because um, I think we left on the 25th of Jan, eh? and on the 23rd, I um, got this email from uh, Virgin Australia, and it said, um, you know those kind of emails that you book a flight and then it sends you like a reminder, like you have 72 hours. And I saw that email and I was like, what the hell? And so um, I remember I rang S and I was like, oh my gosh, I got this email. So my thinking was I'm going to ring the airline and um, somehow – I'm actually one of those people, like, uh, my friends always mock me and call me, like, a customer from hell because um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I never let companies get away with things. Like, I fight, like, all the big companies, I, like, make sure I fight for whatever it is I want. You're just and revealing so, yourself now. <laughs> <laughs> so I had that kind of attitude towards Virgin. It was just, like, in my mind, I was like, nah, God paid that from his bank account, so we're going. Like, that, it's paid. So I rang them, and, um, man, I, was, I, I had to fight with them for two whole days in order for them to just finally agree but i realized years later what happened but they what happened was i rang them and i'm um, they said i told i can't remember the lie i said i think i said um <laughs> me and my friend <laughs> me and my friend are on a um same flight as others and it had changed they said it was changed so if they could look at my ticket i just wanted them to say yeah, yeah it's confirmed but she said, um, it's so strange because everything's all good, but the pay, um, where the bank account stuff is, you know, where the, all the payment details are, was white. It was like blank. And she was like, oh, it's so strange. And then um, we like, I had to argue them for ages. And I just, I don't know, I came up with a lot of um, white lies, <laughs> I think you call them, <laughs> just in order for them to be full. But in the end... Um, I remember it was like the day before where it was, it was the 24th and I was upstairs and I had a, um, I was on a phone call for client and I had the work phone and my personal phone going and um, 
she it was uh, I was going into lunchtime, so I told my mate at the front, I said, Oh, I'll transfer this call to you because I want to take this call. And she was like, Yeah, yeah, we're good. So I went downstairs to the garage and um the lady said to me, I'll put you on hold. And this is like fighting for two days straight now. So I was like, and I was like, oh, you know what, God, all good. If you, if she comes back and she says, because she took my payment details. This is me giving her my bank account details like I had money in there. <laughs> I knew I had no money in there, only my husband's wages. And I was like, all good. If they take it, they take it. It's fine. So I, I thought my account would go into negative, you know, if they take all the money. So I was like, oh, whatever. So I said, oh, yeah, all good, God. If I go, if she says yes. Oh, if she says no, that's fine. I'm not going to fight it anymore. This is the last fight. But if she says yes, I promise you that I will pursue this footwear business with everything that I have. Honestly, like um, a couple of minutes later, she comes back and she's like, all right, are you still there? It's all confirmed. You're leaving tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. And so um, I was like, oh, my gosh, so I drove home to tell my cousin. And um, I said to her, oh. I don't think we have any more money because um they took it all and she was like just have a look and I was you know like um opened my online banking I was trying to look to see but when I had a look they only took a dollar whoa so me and her even like going to the um airport I was so scared because I was like but I was like no 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 you can't do that don't don't be scared God's already paid for it and so uh, we went to the airport, we checked in, they gave us a boarding pass. Wasn't until we were sitting on the plane, I started crying and I was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much, God. Wow. Yeah. And so it's, that stays at the back of my mind yeah. every time I'm like, eh, I don't want to do business anymore. <laughs> it remind, like, I'm reminded of that um, promise that I made God that if he let me go to Vegas, that I would pursue everything. And going to Vegas, that kick-started everything. Wow. So it was definitely a trip that I needed to take. Yeah. What was it about the trip? Oh, because that's where all the suppliers were coming in from China mm. or from around the world. So I needed to go there to meet some suppliers to um, buy shoes off there. Oh, so they oh, so they were bringing shoes and you were just sort of, at that time, you were just exploring eh? yeah. different I shoes and for hopefully bringing them someone, here to yeah. sell. Yeah. Until, so when was the point where you were like, oh, I'm going to make my own now? Oh, at the place. At oh, the, was there? Yeah, it was at the... Um, wow. I met... Um, Tony Shea, he's um, passed on now, but he was the CEO of Zappos. Zappos, they're the on, biggest online retailer and uh, shoe retailer in the world. Mm, this, yeah, it does ring yeah, yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> but just so people understand, these shoes are not like your like, Kmart shoes. Like the yours. shoes that you're you're oh, yeah. after designer yeah. shoes. So the shoes that you're selling range from nine to fifteen. And the Only. price range, so people get um, a good understanding. It's like between a hundred and four hundred. Yeah, yeah. So we're oh. talking about designer oh. yeah. shoes. We, they're very. I ha when I first started looking at making shoes, I wanted them to be like fashionable, and I wanted them to be um, solid, like to be able to hold me. <laughs> And um, like I wanted to be able to run and because I used to wear shoes and the heel would snap. Mm. And in the middle of the day when I'm taking my clients from reception to my desk, I remember I had this blue heel that I bought and it had snapped in half. So I was like <laughs> limping, <laughs> limping to reception and back. So I needed like shoes that are really, really sturdy. So um, that and because of the size, we had to go handmade. So all our shoes are handmade wow. because um, the machines in China are not built for <laughs> um, the kind of shoes that we want and the size that we want. Mm. So Ooh. the shoes that we want, they can make it on machines, but it's the sizes that the sh machines. Mm. And so I like literally have seen them. They, um, they have like, for example, we have these things called mold. I don't know if you've seen them. They're like a plastic mold of a foot. Mm. And we use that to create the shoe on it. So that thing, the machines only go up to 11, oh, but wow. it's like a narrow 11. So it's like our nine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what they do is they use that just to, you put it in this machine and it cuts, it has like these blades that shape it. Mm. And so what they do is they only shape the front and then they take it out and do it manually because wow. you can't, the machine, it can't go any bigger. Yeah. So they, a lot of everything's done for our shoes is all done manually. So, be, so before Stavia's, Islanders would <coughs> go to weddings and you'll see ladies, Islander ladies wearing shoes. 
Like this is the tip of the shit. <laughs> <It's> like that. <laughs> the, the which side? Which side? <laughs> the, you know how you see those pinky fingers, those pinky toes sticking out. But now we have Stavia's shoes. Yeah. Wow. They can fit the whole feet, yeah. eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so that that means you position your shoes at the high end, day. Eh? Yeah, because they cost heaps yeah, to make. Yeah, hard on. I tried to um, because my initial thought was to bring in heaps of shoes and sell them cheaper than, you know, like mm. everyone that was but out on the market at the time. But um, I realised with what I wanted, you know, there was no such thing as cheap over there. And I also thought, it's China, like everything should be cheap. Mm. But no, it's the same as over here, like the good stuff yeah. actually comes off a of price. Even at bulk? Yeah. But if it's handmade, eh? It's yeah, not like because you can do that's any where faster. a lot of the money goes is the labour. Yeah. Because it's handmade. Wow. So, so you went to Las Vegas? To really go and um, connect with suppliers that you can bring them here. And as you got there, you met this guy that Tension, gave you, like, yeah. elevated your vision from buying bulk, selling here to, Creating I can make my own. Yeah, it was funny. I met him. It, I went to one of his, um, you know, when they have trade shows, they always have, like, a speaker there and a stage, and you can go there and have a listen. Well, we had done the whole entire trade show, and we were tired, so we were like, oh, we'll just go sit in and listen to whoever. I don't know who he was, but we went there, and um, I can't remember. He asked something, and I said an answer, and um, he was, like, obsessed with the Kiwi accent. Oh, wow. And so I, like, immediately stood out for him. And so he came over afterwards, and we started talking, and I told him, I've walked around, I think there was like 3,900 booths, because there's always heaps. And um, I walked around and not one of them, like people were like, we can make it, but no one had a shoe there for us to pick and put it on kind of thing. And I actually had met a number of people that were there for the same reason as me. They were all mm. there to find big shoes and we couldn't find anything. And he said to me, just start your own brand, start your label, it's wow. much better. And I was like, oh, I, I had never thought of that. Yeah. And so when he said that, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that then. <laughs> you, you, you know what you're talking about. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. So what was that um, plane ride like home? You must have been like, sweet, I'm going to start designing those shoes now. Oh, yeah, because I had started researching while I was there looking for designers yeah. and stuff. So, yeah, it was a whole lot of writing on the way back from um, wow. Vegas. That's so cool. Um, that trip was the turning point, eh? It was, definitely. So yeah. that whole lead up. God appointed, <laughs> um, it was meant to be, eh? And it was meant to be hard. It was like the do or die. It was. Yeah. Yeah. Could have, like, made it a little bit easier, but... <laughs> it's almost it like, how bad do you want it? Yeah. How bad do it you is. want it? it and you want it really, It really is. It was one of those things that um, I almost feel like I was in a test. Like, how yeah. far are you willing to go yeah. to, like, do you really want to do this <laughs> kind of thing? So, um, yeah, now I'm kind of stuck with it for life. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's one of the things as being a business owner and an entrepreneur, like, the stakes, it all falls on your shoulders. Like, if mm. you don't show up to work or you don't put in the hard yards, it all falls Absolutely. apart, it all crumbles. Yeah. And I suppose there's a, um, you know, when you're in the startup phase, at the beginning, you're having to go to every, like, literally, it's a one-man band. Like, it's just all you going to meetings, connecting with people. And I suppose at the trade show, after that amazing experience getting there, you must have just been like, it's now or never, apply yourself, get out there, network. Um, were there times where, because one of those things is that, like, it's not for everyone, like, not everyone can do what you've done. Mm. Um, are there, can you think of times where you've had to really get out of your comfort zone? Because I, I think there's a lot of men... Um, today that, and I speak from my own personal experience, where we get in our comfort zone and sometimes it's really hard to get out. And unless you're compelled, you're either driven or you're compelled to get out of it, then you kind of yep. just stay there. So what was that like for you in terms of really getting out of your comfort zone? Because there would have been aspects you'd be familiar with, okay with, but perhaps others where you're like, you're scared. Oh, yeah. I, I think I've done this whole entire thing scared. And it got to a point where, um, oh, you know, after the initial, that first, um, where God paid for my fear to go to Vegas, after that, I took on this mentality that I can do anything. Like, um, oh, God will pay for it. Like, you know, I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but I'm like, ah, oh, oh, good, God will pay for it. God will make a way for me to pay for that. So um, I've always had that kind of mentality from there. But it is really hard. When it gets to points where I'm like, 
I need help. Do I learn it or do I try and get someone? I don't have any money. Like, how am I going to do it? And some sometimes I do think um, oh, I'll just go back to, you know, nine to five. And I've actually done that a, um, a couple of times, actually, where I'm just like, oh, I'll just go back to nine to five. But I'm always reminded of my promise. And not only that, when I go to put on shoes, I'm like, oh, damn, I need new shoes. <laughs> or I see like certain clothes that I want to wear and I'm like, Oh, I need like something to go with that. And so um, I've tried so many shoes. Even today, like my um, sister-in-law bought size 12 boots and they're cool. Like I wear them, but um, they're not fitted to my foot. The way Stavia's is literally molded to my foot. Mm. And um, everything I do, like, you know, wearing those shoes or I see clothes or um, I'm reminded of that promise that I make. And I honestly, that promise makes me always go back to business and I'm like ah have to push through even if I don't want to I have to do it and you're right there's no one else that if I don't work it just doesn't happen if I don't get things done in the business it just doesn't happen so um I just have to push through this I don't have this I cannot and sometimes um I will like think like oh I really don't want to do that and I'll try and find any way around it like I, everyone that knows me knows that I can find shortcuts to anything. <laughs> That's cool. I know shortcuts to anything and everything. And I'll do that just to, and I'll try and find ways to get around it or even get out of it. But at the end of the day, it always comes back to you. You need to do it. And I just have to do it. Yeah. You know? And then when I do it, I'm like, man, it took me three months to do that. Could have did it earlier. You know, that kind of thing. But it, it's because um, I don't want to do it or it gets too hard and I'm, I don't want to learn. And a lot of the time, like, I like to, I don't know why I do this to myself, but I like to learn it first so that when the next person that comes and do it, I feel like I can be like, oh, it's not done properly or um, these are shortcuts to how to do it or mm. so that I can, um, I, I feel like if I know how to do it, it makes it easier for me to work with that person and know what to expect for whatever it is we need done. Yeah. Yeah. So, but. I just want to marry, and I don't know whether we. I just want to marry what you've just said, um, with you also saying that um, you know you you've got this strong faith that God's going to pay for it. God's going to pay for it. And when you said that on its own, you know the audience need to also hear the second part of what you said, as while you're saying all of that, you're also doing the work. Oh, absolutely. Like you're grinding yeah. the um the tools or the limited tools or the resources to get stuff done. So it's not like you're just sitting there like, oh yeah, it'll come, it'll yeah. come. You're no. actually grinding, doing. As much as I expect it all to fall out of heaven. <laughs> yeah. Um, it doesn't happen that no. way. Cool. Yeah, awesome. no, it definitely doesn't. I've learned that even, doesn't matter how much faith you have, if you don't put any action into awesome. it, nothing ever um, comes to fruition. So yeah. definitely have to work plus have faith. Yeah. You, God opens doors. And um, those doors are open for you to like walk through and do the work, like walk through and connect with whoever, or, you know, like you still need to go in there and get some sort of work done. He just sort of opens doors in a way that no other person could have opened it for you kind of thing. Mm, yeah. Cause you're already one foot in. Yeah. And so I would do it. And like an industry like fashion where, you know, for, as long as the industry has existed, there's been standards where, mm. you know, the stereotypical standards. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with or how have you dealt with being sort of an outlier in terms of like you're literally having to pave your own path and in doing so open the way for others? Um, but did you face any sort of pushback, kickback, weird looks, all that sort of stuff because you're coming in with your own niche and something completely different? Or has the industry been pretty open with I part? feel like I'm more towards the footwear industry than the fashion industry. And um, with the footwear industry, back then there were no polys at all. I don't know if there were any polys way before me and maybe they're not no longer here or whatever, but... At the time that I went and I created Stavius, there were no polys in the um, in the industry, and um, wow. it was really hard. Not only am I brown, but I'm female, mm. and then I'm from a place called South Auckland. <laughs> like I'm from the hood, and I um, behave like I'm from the hood a lot of the times, <laughs> <laughs> and I speak like I'm from the hood. So it was um, not what they 
you know, the, the box that they have of who fits into the footwear industry. So a lot of the time they um, closed doors on me and they wouldn't help me to figure out what the next step was in the journey. So that's why I was always on a plane in all these different countries trying to figure out what is the next step. Wow. And I found that New Zealand, like the big players, I know who they are now and we know each other. We're all good now. Um, but back then, I feel like they too went out to try and find what the next step was. Mm. Like they're based in New Zealand, but a lot of their team were like doing things in New York and, you know, that sort of thing. And so I was like, oh, that's probably how it works. And the more I worked and the more research I did, I found that that is literally how it works. They copy that side of the world. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it was hard. It was so hard to try and... Um, it's, it's like walking into the room and everyone's looking at you like, you don't belong here. What are you doing here? A lot of the time. For the, but now um, a lot of people know who I am, like in the industry, mm. in our um, footwear industry, a lot of people know who I am in Australia and New Zealand and China. So um, now I'm still the same. Like I'm, I still speak like from, from the hood. And, um, and I feel like that makes it more relatable to them too, yeah. especially in China. But um, it was very hard, very hard trying to push in. And I'm brown. In, in, in a country like China, they are used to white businessmen. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter like what race, but you just have to be the colour white. Mm -hmm. So when I come in, and I come in with like jandals and shorts and singlets, that's like my everyday <laughs> attire. And then, um, and then I don't know the language. You know, there's a specific language as well, so I don't know the language. And then, um, and I come in, I'm like, fear poco, like, I'm like, oh, nah, I don't like that. You know, and they're like looking at me like, who do you think you are? You don't have, you know. And I remember the factory said to me, um, where's your boss? And I was like, oh, no, no, I am the boss. And then he was like, where's your husband? Like, they could not comprehend wow. that a brown woman is the boss. Wow. So it, it was a lot of walls that we had to push through and keep on, I think, what made them open doors eventually was that they saw that I was consistent. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, here she goes. <laughs> oh, there she is again. Like that kind of thing. And I feel like that was when they finally were like, oh, we'll take her seriously. We'll see what she's about. Yeah. yeah. How, how did you oh. feel in those moments? Did, did you feel less of a person or that you were in the wrong place? Or did, um, did the Gus or the hood Gus just take over or you just continue to grind you can nah i belong here i i at first when i first i'd be like i would be offended mm. if i found that um it was from people in new zealand like i'm like how dare you like well you know you you already know what island you know that we all live in um with islanders and maoris and brown people it's not like anything new in our community but um when i went to china i had to try and understand that that was their culture and that's what they're used to. Mm. And so what I did was I try and adapt that mentality everywhere I go so that I don't get offended because I've learned that you don't get anything done when you get offended. Mm, nice. But when you try that's and powerful. work with people, they are more, um, you know, willing to be open to yeah. sort of help you out a bit. So um, I, yeah, I only got offended when it was from the New Zealand lot because I'm like, we already work together in New Zealand. Why are you behaving that way? So... What was, what's your what's your mentality when um, I like what you just said? You don't get stuff done when you're offended. Is that just what your mindset is in those moments when you feel that bit of I don't know if it's discrimination or just people not connecting because we don't fit whatever mold? Like, do you just go, yeah, I can't be offended because it will get in the way of my work, or do you just how do you reframe that? Like, I feel like I'm always like, ooh, the audacity. And then I will <laughs> go in. Um, and then I'll be like, oh, yeah, you wait. And then I work harder. To yeah. make, and um, honestly, like back at my work and income days, that's what pushed me to be better because I um, had a bit of run-in with my bosses. They just thought, I don't know, they thought my personality was too big for the mould that they had or what they saw as work and income workers. And so um, they, I always felt like they would pick on me. And they would treat me, um, they'll pull me up for little things. But my work ethic, uh, not my work ethic, the work that I did. The quality. <laughs> the quality yeah. of my work. Like I was always really, really good. Yeah. 
And so um, I told myself I wanted to be better than them. Like, this is, I know this <laughs> might sound bad, but I was like, I want to be on a stage where I look down on them. Mm. And that's what motivated me to keep going on the top. And so I had that kind of attitude all throughout. Like when people look down on me, when I feel looked down on, um, I always like would take note, mental note of it. And I'm like, bro, one day I'm going to be standing on here <laughs> and I'll be looking down at you. And that's the kind of mentality I keep. Yeah, good. Oh. That's powerful. And I hope people hear this because sometimes I think we just live in a communi- um, in a world right now where people just get easily offended. Oh, you know, yes. and they just go and then they sit in a rut for ages and you're like, oh my gosh, get out, you know, get over it, like yeah. move on. Um, I love so Australia, love but Australia is bad for that. People in Australia are bad for getting offended at every little thing. Because they're whiners, eh? No, I'm just kidding. We love Australian people. We love Australian people. We love Australian people. <laughs> 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 But that is definitely one thing I noticed from the day I moved over is that they get offended. And I always, I wasn't sure if it was like the South Auckland humour because I know it can be much mm, yeah. or the mocking, you know. <laughs> but um, no, nah, yeah, that's just how they are. And plus our mocking's <laughs> only for hero. <laughs> yeah, de- definitely keep it here. Yeah. Because <laughs> even if you take some of the South Auckland mocking down to other parts of New Zealand. New Zealand, mm, yeah. It just doesn't not, jam. Yeah. Definitely. Oh man, I love that mindset. That's cool. I don't know how many people are offended over the years when <laughs> go to other places. I just want to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, Take the opportunity yeah. to apologize. Mm. Fuck what is it? Mm. Man, I can starve you. I tell you what, just listening to you the last few minutes and just listening to what you have to share and what you've just shared mm. about the business, your journey thus far and the push and the drive, the tenacity for you to continue to push and the promise you made to, to God. Outstanding. It really is. Obviously, the mandate, you, it's about encouraging men and the whole premise is inspiring other men. But I can guarantee you right now, a lot of men, and, and also our, our, our wahine, are watching this and viewing this and saying, man, wow, if she can do it, then why can't I do it? And you're just kind of giving the little bits of, of, of your, your story. Um, but in terms of the, the, your, your journey thus far, what has it been? Because there's been a lot of things along the journey you've, you've picked up and you've gained and you've garnered, you've, you've, you've learned. But along the whole process, what has been the utmost number one thing that you've taken is like, man, this is the most important thing in the journey of business or being an entrepreneur? Oh, I read something recently and I feel like it resonated with me. Um, success is based on your character. You know, um, when you first start business, you feel like it's an IQ thing, which it probably is, to be honest. Like you can't be, you have to be at a certain, a certain level of um, smart, I guess, to be able to push through and to find what the next step is. But to keep that and to keep at it, I feel like you have to be emotionally intelligent. So then it mm. switches from IQ to EQ. And um, that's something that I've definitely learned over the last decade of business is that um, success is character based not so much anything else That's or true. more than anything else it's powerful it's very it's, true it is, it is, it is. I, I love what you said emotional intelligence I, I think a lot of people think oh you need the degrees you need the paper mm. to kind of qualify you as the person or even those men say hey who's the boss where's the boss where's your husband but in terms of understanding and emotionally understanding or being able to relate to someone it's more powerful than some of those I, know, I guess you could say some of the some of the qualifications that people have. Oh yeah, definitely. I I um dropped out of school. Oh, and I'm not encouraging this, by the way, guys, stay in school. <laughs> um, but I dropped out of school when I was like, I think it was fourteen, year ten, halfway, like term two or oh, term two of year eleven. I dropped out of school. Oh, t- week two, sorry. I just thought oh, I don't want to do school anymore. Yeah. I'm not encouraging it, like I said. I'm just because yeah, your that. sons are listening, <laughs> <laughs> and they're not out of the school. <laughs> you, you didn't just drop out, right? You didn't just drop out and say school's not for me. You must have found something else. Oh yeah, I dropped out and had a baby. <laughs> 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 it's a good segue. Let's talk about the story now. <laughs> okay, we'll yeah. come back to that. But I'm just really, um, you know, going off your quote about character. Because um, I think many people um, have an idea for a business, eh? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're such creative beings. Many, many, many people would wake up one morning and go, yeah, I'll do this, I'll do that. And they see what you see. They've seen a problem and I can, I've got a solution for it. And this can all happen in a lot of our 
minds, our brains. Um, but what you've said is huge. Like it takes character to now move that idea into a concept, from a concept into a um, uh, onto uh, into a, a plan, um, and then while while it's still on paper, you then now have to walk it out. Execute. That yeah. is all character stuff. Um, and so, if people are out there thinking you need to have the brains for it, or you need to have some level of creativity, you've hit it on the spot. So, mm. my question to you now is, what shaped your character? Like, you, it does. It takes gusto. Mm. For anyone to do what you've done, and I'm so like, what country did she go to? Like, you better share that soon, um, you know, because as you uh, experienced all these countries, you got to see so much, and that would have just fueled it, fueled it more. But coming back to what you just said, you said character. What is what's shaped that character of yours that's enabled you? To push through, like this is a massive. This is mm. massive to go. I'm going to go and be someone. Um, and I'm not talking ego, and even though there's a little bit of ego that's required. Yeah. <laughs> um, but for yeah. someone to go, I'm going to make my mark in the um, footwear industry, and I'm going to show up 10, 15 times before they start taking me serious because I'm not white and I'm not a man. Um, I'm a woman and I'm brown and I'm from South Auckland. What's that? Who, what? yeah, how did, how's that character shaped. been shaped? Because would you say you were born with it or was it part of your upbringing? I feel like... Um my personality was sort of um, part of my upbringing. So um, we'll probably get into this later on, but my upbringing was like quite violent. Mm. So it made me like a fighter. Yeah. So, um, tough. yeah, you're yeah, very tough. And especially like in a place like South Auckland, that's what we do when we were young. We used to fight it out. So that made me tough, but it also made me tough mentally. The mm. struggles that I went through as a child kind of made me um, tough mentally. So, that and then um, I've always been a curious individual. Like uh, um, when I was young, I, c I couldn't ask people for help because I, well, when I was really, really young, I would get a hiding, you know, or get a smack or get in trouble mm. if I asked too many questions. So I'm like this little kid sitting there with all these questions in my mind, like, why does that table turn? Or, you know, like things like that. And so I would always um, try and find out myself. If I saw the table was turning and I'm trying to figure out why, I would like look under to see how the screws were made, just so I could understand how it turned kind of thing. Mm. And I've always been that kind of person. And then I went and I, I got a job at Work and Income. I think my time, definitely my time at Work and Income gave me perspective because mm. prior to that, I, or when I first got into Work and Income, actually, I was like, yeah, I'm the man. Like, I'm on this side, you're on that side, you're asking me for money. That was kind of the mentality. And I feel like every new recruit goes through that, where you um, feel a bit, you know, like you're sort of on top of all these people where they come in every single week asking for help and you're the person that gets to sign the check and be like, yeah, all good, you got $200 this week. And um, after like a couple of years, I because they put me on, like I would look after certain groups of people. So for example, um, I used to do the job seekers and then they put me with the single parents, the under 20s. And then I had like all the gang members. Oh, that was my favorite, the gang members. Um, so I feel like I learned how they thought and um, I started to become more grateful that I was in a better position because I made better choices for myself because I could have easily been in that position. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like that my, my time at Work and Income definitely shaped who I am yeah. today. That played a huge part um, dealing with all these different people, all their problems and I feel like that's how I come up with like excuses and that's how I get around anything because I heard every single <laughs> lie under the sun, <laughs> every excuse and any, every situation other than the sun. I did 10 years. I, I've heard it all. So um, I can it help that help to keep on shaping, but I feel like your character is not just built over a certain time. Mm. Like, the Gustavia um, today is not the person that I was two years ago. Mm. Two years ago, I was still the type of person that I need to win. I need to have the final say. There's no ifs or buts. If I don't have the final say, this argument's not over. Like, I'm that kind of person. I will fight until I'm the last one talking. And I um, will go all sorts of low. Like I will offend them on every possible level <laughs> just to win. 
Now, I actually had to, um, like, I did the work in income, had my kids really, really young mm. and um, got married so, so young. I feel like all of that has built mm. who I am today. And um, just recently, like the last two years, I did a lot of therapy. I honestly, all these years, I was like, therapy is for people who need help. Like the people that sit on that side of the desk, not for the people who sit on this side of the desk. But um, I just decided that I wanted to go there. Mm -hmm. Like I was thinking, I don't want to burden people with my, you know, whatever I was going through. And I was like, I'll just do therapy. And um, at therapy, at therapy, sorry, they make you, they unpack your life literally from the day you were born. Yeah. And so that too has helped me see things in a whole different perspective. And um, the most important thing, though, out of all of that, that helps to build your character is the word of God. I know, like everyone watching, is going to be like, "Bro, I see that girl partying every <laughs> weekend. <laughs> <laughs> she travels to go to festivals and party. Like, I'm very well known for that." Um, <laughs> But it doesn't mean that I'm not reading my Bible mm. and still praying and still um, talking to God because I do that uh, very much. And I am, I know that I cannot get to the next step and I cannot get what yeah. I want unless I have God. So yeah. I know God's still working with me. Sooner yeah. or later, I'll, I'll grow up and stop partying and drinking, <laughs> but um, God's all good for now. <laughs> Is that networking? Mm. It's networking, eh, not partying. I feel, absolutely yeah 100 <laughs> that's the word sorry <laughs> but yeah all of that all of that life experience um I feel has built the character that I yeah the person who I am today yeah oh, man, that's cool that's cool I was blessed to I know like at the time it wasn't very nice but I feel like I'm very blessed that God allowed me to experience so much at such a young age that it shaped my perspective, you know. Mm. And I'm um, like, we, I, I went to the same church as these guys since 2012, yeah, or 2011. And so we finally left New Zealand in 2017. And our pastor, Pastor Chris Sola, oh, he is so good at um, getting you, like, like inspiring you. Mm. And I feel like he too played a very, very um, huge part in um, shaping my perspective, shaping my mentality, and um, choosing who I wanted to become. Wow, Pastor Chris definitely hundred played a massive part in that. Yeah, is that identity, or is it like is it the sort of work he did with you? Or? Oh, it was just like through his sermons. Yeah, yeah, like cool. just through his sermons and watching him as a person. He was a huge, you know, not a lot of people know this, probably like only, like, there's only a few, but Pastor Chris was the one that came up with the name Stavius. Oh, really? Like, oh. I came back from Vegas and I was telling him what happened. Um, and I was like, yeah, the guy was saying to um, start my own label. And he was like, yeah, that'll be cool. Because I don't know if you've spoken to him. He doesn't really show too much emotion or you know, enthusiasm. He's just very straight kind of thing. And he's like, yeah, that's pretty cool. You should call it Stavius. And I was like, actually, yeah, that is exactly what I'm going to call it. And wow. that's how we got our name. Mm. Yeah. Did he give you a story behind it? Or do you have a story behind the name? No, it's just taken from my name, Gustavia. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Oh, man. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> uh, I remember during that time too, because Pastor, Pastor Chris used to have a lot of sermons that would challenge our mindsets around ch be, um, challenging the status quo. I mean, he talked about um, South Auckland. He would often talk about like, man, look at the businesses around here. If this place is full of Pacifica, why aren't uh, the business all filled with Pacifica? Like we're on the wrong side of the counter. We, we, we should be the business owners and you really ch challenge that poverty mindset and and um is probably the only one listening to the <laughs> sermons because she was the one that <laughs> took it on board and, then, and now she's on the other side of the camera and um but yeah he, he he's massive i can't wait to get him get him on at one stage but um yeah I l <laughs> he really drilled that into us yeah so. yeah had a, that's awesome and, and just speaking on like Pastor Chris, and I imagine there are other men of influence in your life, but are you able to touch base on some of the significant men who have had impact on your life and perhaps some of the common traits that they've had that you've sort of identified as, you know, really positive and the ones that you needed at certain uh, times and aspects of your life? I, I um, growing up, I never really had many male figures um, around or father figures. Oh, I had my, my dad, but... 
Um, we didn't really have a good relationship growing up. But my mum's siblings all played a part in raising me. And so my mum has this oldest, her oldest brother. He was like the godfather for all of us. <laughs> and he um, very much, like, I feel like um, he played a huge part in who we are. Like, he's all about, because they're orphans. So my mum and her siblings are all orphans. Mm. And, um, but they all became successful. Like CEOs, Fefe Owls, they're, wow. they're very successful people, um, the siblings. And so they pushed their kids and he would always talk to me like that. Like he'll be like, Nia, my Samoan name is Nia. So he'll be like, Nia, make sure you go to school, you um, go to uni. He's big on going to uni and getting yourself a good job. And I felt like in my family, you were only respected if you had something good going for you. It's probably not, but that's just what I thought mm, at the time. Yeah. But I have that uncle. And then I had um, and Pastor Chris and... Any other, like, male that I had in my life, I learned heaps from them, but I learned um, what not to do. (laughs) (laughs) And then I had um, the boys that are like my brothers. Charles is definitely one of them. Um, Just these guys that are like um, brothers to me who would encourage me and they believed in me. Like, they'll be like, Bryce, you got this. Keep going, keep going. And, um, yeah, I'm trying to think, to be honest... Yeah, that would be the main two was uh, my mm. uncle, definitely. He, um, he he was a big push. He would always, every That's time so we cool. talked, he would. And I would feel so good every time because he lived in Samoa. He's been all around the world, but he decided he wanted to live in Samoa. And he comes here a lot. He used to come to New Zealand a lot. And he would come. And if he always wanted to come to my house. And I feel like that validated what I was doing, like, okay, he's happy with me. Because if he's not, he's not going to go to your house. He, he wouldn't go to my mom's house and he'll be not happy with her. So I was like, okay, if he's not happy, he's not coming to your house. So, um, yeah, I didn't really have that many male figures, but definitely my uncle, Pastor Chris, and then my brothers, and including Charles. Charles, definitely one of them. How cool is that, eh, to have an uncle that does that? Mm. And it's very rare that uncles just, you know, visit there. Like, at least uh, I'm talking in the context of um, he must have seen something, he believed in it, and he's like, got to keep this girl on it. Yeah, nah, he was like that for all of us, like all his nieces and nephews. He would um, we'd all sit down and he would growl us, like, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> why, why are you having kids so young? He's like, that's too many kids. I had like two. Like, that's way too many kids for you at that age. Like, he was like that. Yeah. So we always had to have, like, a good update. You know, like, when he came, he's like, all wow. right, tell me what's been <laughs> happening. I used to, like, use a lot of my time to snitch on my brothers so that, um, you know, he wouldn't really focus <laughs> too much on me and focus on them. But he was like that for all of us. That's cool. Even his sisters, he would be like, what are you doing? What have you been up to? Yeah. He's good. Are you, <laughs> that, are you that auntie to your nieces and nephews? <laughs> Always, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that's I'm always of... yeah, pushing them to yeah. trying to open doors for them. And yeah, that's yeah. cool. You, you need, need someone it. like that, though, eh? I was, I, that's what you were going to say, yeah? Yeah. And, uh, like, everyone needs someone to, like, sort of keep you in check and keep you accountable, keep you on your toes. Mm. Cause it's really easy to just, like... Yeah. Fall back oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or have really empty chickens. And, and you know, it's always, astu- it's always astounding, Bujani. It's usually just that one voice, eh? Yeah. It's always that one voice that's yeah. against the grain, yeah. not the norm. That's true, yeah. Like it's the... The majority are always with, you know, <laughs> go with the flow kind of thing. Yeah, and you're like, uh, like you want to be that auntie or uncle or mum, you know, you want to be that family member in a whanau or an ainga where you're seeing the best out of everyone and you yeah. want everyone to achieve. Yeah, I love definitely. That. That's cool. You're amazing, Caroline. Keep on going. <laughs> uh, training tag. He's going to do it. <laughs> now nah, you can do it. <laughs> That's cool. But, but how about, if you could explain to us, um, Gustavi, because I know you're busy. You, you, I can imagine you're a busy, busy lady, but also the, the balancing act, the juggling act. How do you juggle everything of your business and family and, and the kids and all that kind of stuff, extended family and all the other stuff that you do as, as not only as a, as a woman but also as a mother, uh, as a wife, all that kind of stuff. How do you kind of put everything together and still keep your sanity in, in all the, the midst of all the, the craziness? Uh, it's funny because I only like this year I decided to say no to a lot of things. I get invited to so many things and... Um, 
um, asked to participate in a lot of things. And this year I was like, nah, I don't want to do any of that actually. I just want to chill. And so, um, but I, I feel like, because I travelled a lot. Pre-COVID, I was here like maybe five to six months a year, like out of the whole entire year. But I would live on a plane outside. And so um, my husband, obviously, he would fill in, um, look after the boys. And then we lived like a house apart from my parents. Oh. And my mom and my siblings lived there. So they would help out. My mom helps heaps. She and my husband would mainly do it all because I'm the type of person that I travel, but I want them to keep my routine for my kids. <laughs> so I'm like, mom, remember my kids have this. Mom, I got to get them. You got to get them to training or you got to get them to school on time. So my mom and um, my husband definitely played a huge part. Like when I needed to travel, for example, I had DeAndre, that's my baby. And I had to come to New Zealand and I think he was like five weeks old. So I came to New Zealand for 24 hours. But in that 24 hours, he stayed with my brother because my mum wasn't able to come over in time. So he stayed with my brother. So my siblings usually help out. My mum definitely and obviously their dad. And then um, I just, I don't like to be busy. And I feel like when I catch up with people and I'm like, what are you up to? And they're like, oh, we've been so busy. I think of myself and I'm like, what am I busy? Because a lot of the time, if I um, I have a lot of downtime where I just chill. I catch up with my mates and I chill and that. That's like my uh, my me time. Um, in addition to the flying, that's my <laughs> me time catch up. But I, I, I feel like if you make things a priority, you will find the time somewhere. Mm -hmm. I never used to sleep a lot. Like I would sleep on three to five hours for years now I can't do that I have to have at least six to seven hours of sleep um but you just I don't know how to do it. I keep my kids schedule their schedule is very important to me but I also um business is important to me too so I kind of find a way to make both of it work if I have mm -hmm. to work, wake up early and get certain things done before they go to school and then get it done late at night when they're all in bed you know had dinner washing's done, whatever, then that's what I'll do. But I will always work it around whatever I find is important, which is obviously my kids. It's cool. It's so good to know that um, it's, it must feel so nice to know that you've got good support in place. Mm, hey. Definitely. It helps. Yeah, to yeah. help manage some of the mum roles um, and then uh, just know that they've got your back. Whenever you just can't do something, you know, someone else from the family is able to step in. Yeah. I have certain friends, like I have certain um, friends that I can call to. That's cool. Yeah, which is really, really nice because I know and I've met a whole lot of people and a lot of people don't have that. Mm. Yeah, And at first I was like, why don't you? Like, how come people don't allow you to call them? But I've learned that it's, it's, got, nothing to do with it. like, it's got nothing to do with them. It's just, I don't know, the way it is. Yeah. yeah. Some I was people gonna say that's them. so blessed to have extended family and friends that you can call yeah. on to help. Yeah. It's it's so hard, yeah, you know, to have kids and keep your ambition or your mm. dreams alive. Like Especially as a woman, I feel. Mm. Like a lot of men can do that because they have a woman that will support or you know, the woman usually does the kids and stuff like that. So as a woman, I feel like for me it's a huge achievement that I've been able to um have the best of both worlds, have the business, but also have my kids. And because I had them so young as well, now they're all growing, mm. um, which really, really helps. But um, definitely a blessing to be able to do both as yeah. a woman. Cool. Yeah, mm. and be present eh, yes. when, you, when you're there. Yeah. Um, and I liked what you just said. So profound. Like, um, you know, we need to stop saying I'm busy all the time because we're really not. I mean, we are, but we're not prioritising. I have fair. a thought on that though, yeah. on why people say that. Because I used to, I would always, you know, I used to always say I'm busy, and I feel like people like to feel like they're being productive. Busyness doesn't necessarily equal, equal being productive, productive yeah. but they like to feel like they're making <laughs> leeway on yeah. some whatever their journey is. So we often say we're busy, mm. but I don't know. It was just a thought, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that what you were meaning? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, but everything's like, purposeful in everything that you're trying to do. I try to, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, I, and I like that you kind of made that as a statement. Like, you know, stop saying <laughs> we're busy. I'm going to stop saying um, that now. Yeah. We're saying that lately. But, yeah, it does. It just comes down to you can find the time. You just got to prioritize. Yeah. Mm. Um, but I think we end up just, and I like what you even said, oh, this year I've just decided to chill, <laughs> like yeah. pull back. Um, 
and making those decisions and being 100% present in that decision eh, is so important. Yeah, I think there's I a lot that. of fear sometimes in, make, in prioritizing things that we know we should. Yeah. Because we kind of assume that people have their lives in order. Social media's probably helped with this. Um, <laughs> but we sometimes get scared. And again, my own experience. But I think sometimes we get scared to prioritize the things we know we need because we're like, oh, but other people, you know, they haven't prioritized it. They've just been able to make it happen. And because it's the norm, we feel like either there's something wrong with the way we're doing things or the, who we are. Um, and it makes us fearful to prioritise things. Yeah. yeah. So that, um, not feeling like... It, it's it's that social group stuff, eh? Mm. Like you want to be part of the group, you want to have a sense of belonging, and with that comes your sense of identity when in the moment you're like, actually... <laughs> I think that's why your journey is so fascinating to me because it seems like you've got some really good people around you where you feel like you belong, you feel like confident in who you are, but yet a lot of the battles you've faced you're almost just from the outside it would look like you're the only person operating in lots of different spaces and yet you don't you come across as someone who's quite happy with who they are and like you know you don't have at least on the outside yeah you know? yeah no i am like i i feel like i am people always ask me they're like are you happy and i'm like oh do I, they? yeah why do they ask you that um, because <laughs> you're because you're a millionaire. That's what. That's our resting. That's our resting faces. That's why sometimes our resting faces. Nah, you know, like um, just, just of checking life in. And yeah, yeah. Like, they're like, are you genuinely happy? And I'm, I think about it, and I'm like, I'm actually really happy. Yeah, like, I don't. I don't do. I'm not the type of person that people can force me to do things. Yeah. Um, I'm not easily influenced. I'm the. T- I actually am the influencer. Like I influence, <laughs> you are the influencer. people to do um, things, yeah. but I'm not easily influenced unless I. You can give me like a whole lot of reasons of how it's going to benefit me. It's yeah. Usually I don't go. So like if I get invited to things I don't want to go, I'm not going to go. Like yeah. there's no talking me into it. So um, yeah, I just people. I thought about it the other day. I actually think about it quite a lot, and I'm like. At the end of the day, you choose to be happy. That's mm. what I believe. And um, and I that's what I choose to be. I mean, I don't want to be sad every day. Like, what a stink life. I want to, like, live a good life. And because people see me partying heaps. And um, it was so funny because I was talking to my brother the other day. And um, someone asked me if I was, are oh, you good, sis? Like, I see you out a lot. And I'm like... I think because we hear a lot of stories like where people say this thing like I was in a dark place and I was drinking and th- I'm like to be honest this is like the best thing I love partying I literally <laughs> party just to party to have fun yeah and it's because I'm happy this is what I do when I'm happy yeah so um yeah I guess it's different for everyone but I am honestly genuinely mm. and I'm very always happy cool that's good that's the main thing as long as you know I, I love that we're on this happy note um but <laughs> only if you feel comfortable because i love your story and you know when you go onto the starvius page um it talks about this is our story and you you what you're known for and people that know you is that you're real and then what you're real about you start that off on your testimonial on your business page the and blog you, the blog and you go through man you're your upbringing and I, I think it's amazing and I, the only reason why I want you to sort of take us through that journey is because there's kids like you that um that go through that life yeah and they'll either turn up on the other side of that counter but you've ended up in a place where you get to travel the world that you're the strong um, poly woman that knows who she is and that really content of where she is in life and you got these four boys that you man they're they're amazing as well and you 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 manage to um care and nurture them and so it'll be cool if you're if you're all good with it to share us your blog but yeah in life i've healed now so it's all good yeah (laughs) (laughs) but no growing up was um very difficult and i don't tell my story to make people um dislike anyone in my life Mm. that you know was mean to me or didn't even think but it's just it's just the story this is the facts and this is what happened in my life it's just the events of my life but growing up my mom said i was born in um 
Wellington and then we moved to Christchurch. So funny because when we were in Christchurch, I was really, really young and it was me, my mum and my older brother. My mum's siblings would go halves on paying our rent and our power mm. and our groceries because my mum wasn't a resident here at the time and um, she had no money. And so that's what, and we lived in Christchurch because my mum's other brother was studying there. So we, um, yeah, so they paid our rent mm. and then the other sister would pay for our groceries. And my eldest uncle, the one that I talked about, he would fly into chicken on us all the time, <laughs> make sure we were all good. Wow. Yeah, that was pretty cool. So with that, and then we moved to Auckland. When he finished studying, he went back to Samoa. My auntie, I think she went back to England. And so um, we moved to oh, South. Mm. And uh, I moved to South when I was three. Wow. Yeah. And then um, we lived in a housing New Zealand home in Takanini. And that's where my mum met my her husband, my dad. And, um, yeah, it wasn't smooth sailing. Eh? He was uh, very abusive. And I um, I don't know if this is like an actual term, but we call it like the step, um, the stepchild syndrome. You know, where you just, I feel like you've got to hiding because you're the stepchild. Because mm-hmm. it was just me and my older brother. And so we would get hidings. And, you know, people talk about hidings and they talk about, um, like, the bout kind of thing. We got hidings like broken bones and wow. black eyes. And it was very bad to the point that we got um, lifted out of care. Mm. So my older brother, he, I was seven when I got lifted out of care. I got a, hold, I got a hiding this one night where he, you know, back then they had the prams that have the four wheels. You know, now we have like the thing, but yeah. back, and they're like massive heavy wheels. Yeah, he threw that at me when I was getting ready for school because I was making too much noise and I blocked my face and he broke my arm in three. Oh, all right. And then um, I went to school and I go to school in tell. You know, they're like, <laughs> don't tell. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to tell. Then I go to school and I'm like, guess what? I got a hiding. And it's really, and look at this, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I, would, I was that kid. And so um, I, we got taken out of care. So... I lived with so many aunties and um, my brother lived with Fal Fifi L at the time and he stayed there all the way till he was legal. Wow. Yeah, I was the one that got moved around, but it was because I was really naughty and no one could handle me. <laughs> and so I would go from auntie to auntie to auntie to uncle to auntie. Actually, I never went to any uncles. They were all aunties. Like, mm. all the women were related to my mum. Mm. So my mum's sisters, my mum's cousin, even went to my dad's sister, and um, no one could handle me. So around 14 or maybe 13, oh, yeah, it would have been around 11, actually, 11, 12, my mom begged her older sister to let me stay with her mm. because that was the last resort. I was going into the foster care now. Wow. And um, my mom was like, oh, we're going to lose her if she goes through the system. And my older auntie, she had no kids at the time. And she was old, like older, and um, in her 40s, and she had no children and no partner, so it was just me, like she had a house for, um, by herself. Mm. And so my mom was like, please, can you please? And if she's naughty, I'll fussy her for you, don't worry. And so I stayed there like for the three years until I decided, oh, later I'm going. But mm. it was very hard. I lived in fear my entire life. And although if you look back and you see like I was drug dealing and I was fighting, like we have, um, you know, like scheduled fights. <laughs> Like, you know, like that kind of thing. We're like uh, breaking into cars and all sorts of stuff. And it may look like I'm, I'm like this tough person, but I actually was living in fear. Like mm. I was so scared and I would still do it. It wouldn't stop me from doing it. I think at that point I felt like um, I can get all the hidings you can possibly give me. It's not going to do anything to me. So, um, yeah, and then I ended up meeting my husband and then I got pregnant at 16 and had my son and um that's when life turned around when I had my son my eldest son he's 19 soon yeah wow. in a couple of months oh yeah he is and um but he when I had him life changed around but just growing up it was really really hard I really felt like um no one really loved me mm-hmm. like as a kid and so I feel like as a kid, when you think that no one loves you and that you're not important, you just start being reckless with your life. And I feel like you low-key hope that you're so reckless that you end up dying and that'll be the end of it. Mm. Um, but yeah, God definitely helped me through that. <laughs> I always think about it. I was, I'm like, 
not always think about it, but I have thought about it sometimes where I'm like, I wonder if God was like holding the back of my awful like, <laughs> come here, you little brat. <laughs> but, he was. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel like I'm grateful. I mean, it, it, it was really bad. Like I can remember hidings um, like it was yesterday. Mm. And this, so I'm deaf in this ear, like completely deaf, oh. but I couldn't have hearing aids because um, it's not natural. So you can only have hearing aids if you are naturally deaf. Really? Yeah, I never knew that until I, heard, I went in. Um, God. And um, it was from the trauma, like the nerve was dead from the hiding that I got. I got hit on the same ear f- like more than 30 times. Um, and it was, uh, you know those, I always call them wrestling butts. Those belts you yeah. use in the gym? Yes. Mm. Yeah, got hit with that. God, that's a big belt. Yeah, and it um, killed the nerve. And so, How old were you when it killed the nerve? Oh, I was in high school. Oh I think I was gosh. in high school, yeah. So, Was it the hiding from the stepdad? Or? Yeah, yeah. No one else would give me hidings. Which so is he was still, you were still in contact with him? Even oh, yeah, because um, we, would, we would go, oh, actually, when I was 14... Um, I th- oh no, I think it was like a year before I got pregnant. My auntie fell really sick, mm. and me and her had to move back to my mom's house. Oh, yeah. So that year was a year I didn't even live there. To be honest, I was like always running away. I was like never home because I was running away, and that's why I come back and get a hiding. Yeah. <laughs> and then after that, I was like, oh no, I'm going. How so. did like with all the different? I mean, that's massive for any kid, hey. Eh? And I love what you just yeah. said. You know, when a kid isn't feeling loved. These are some of the behaviours that yeah, they express. That they and quite often, you know, our, we grew up in that um, era of, um, you know, remember that story they used to read in um, schools, um, the boy that cried wolf, and all of a sudden there was a slogan that came out um, that you've got to be careful of the kids that are attention-seeking. And then our generation, we, um, we see a kid that's misbehaving, we're like, oh, what an attention-seeker. Yeah. Not actually realising, actually, they're seeking friggin' Mm, attention. And so what you're sharing there is, um, you know, these are some of the behaviours that were all a cry for help. Mm. And it's just unfortunate that people don't pick up on it. Yeah, even in school. Yeah, I was just about to say, in the school They would label me the, the bad kid, like I was always the bad kid. And now that I'm an adult and I think back, I'm like... Why did no one be like, what's going on in this yeah. girl's life? Like, why does she behave like this? It's not yeah. normal. Yeah. But instead, they'd just like kick me out of class and I would do stupid stuff like set off fireworks in the classroom. Yeah. Like really ridiculous things. Like if today I would think, okay, that, there's something not right with that kid. Mm. What's going on? Yeah. But back then it was just like, get her out of here. We'll kick yeah. her out. Yeah. So they could follow the shortcuts. Eh? Yeah. Don't want to deal with it. Don't know what we're going to yeah. open up. Put them in the too hard basket. Yeah. I, mean, I would have left school too. Yeah. yeah. I, I got expelled from all the schools that I went to. Oh, not all of them, but I went to all the schools in Manidewa and Teknini. Wow. Got kicked out of them. Got kicked out of all the intermediates, Green Meadows, Manidewa. And then um, this teacher, his name is Mr. Kurose. He um, was the teacher at Teknini Primary. And mm. they did, they were finally having um, seven and eight, year seven and eight, like it was a new thing coming out <laughs> back then. And then he, so my mum went and said, oh, please, please, no one else will take my daughter. Can you please take her? And he was like, yeah, yeah I'll take her. So he, um, yeah, he took me on, even though I was so naughty. And so I think I was only year seven, but I stayed with him. He did the year eights. Mm. So I did two years in year eight with him. Wow. Because he was like, it's all right, I told your mum I'll look after you. And is he oh, one of the yeah. influencing things? Absolutely. Actually, Another one to yeah. add to the list? He is. And because um, just before I left, I served on the board of trustees for his school because he's a principal. Oh, Mr. Colossi. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Colossi, Tony Colossi. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's yeah. cool. Did you, did you, I'm also, um, you know, you know, you know how you just describe how God held the back of your collar and praise God, eh, that you didn't get, that, 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 that those, um, sorry, you know, that all of those experiences didn't like put you in a rut, Mm. you know. And they make you feel like you couldn't, because I can imagine if you're getting expelled all the time, they would create like a label in your head and almost make you feel like, oh, I'm going to expect this anyway. Everyone else thinks of me and looks at me this way. 
and you didn't buy into that. I just yeah. love that you took all of this, all these experiences, and they're pretty hard. And you've just used the, um, the you know, um, risk taking behaviors, mm. <laughs> taking all those risk taking yep. behaviors, and you've used it to just, you know, take on the world. I just, I love that. I absolutely love that. And mm. and and I guess you know, because you, you know, we do work in the prisons now and then. And you see these guys, and they're just freaking um, geniuses, geniuses to another level. And you're like, why are you here? Yeah. Why are you here? And the intelligence and the risk taking behavior is neck level. This is like, like this is the the um the lane of the Elon Musk's and the you know and the Jeff Bezos. Those ones that just will have that work ethic, they have the passion, and they'll just take risks and they'll run it. Um, but I'm like, why are, they, why are you guys here? Well, yeah. And you kind of go, yeah, there's a story behind that. Yeah. And they bought into that mentality and they bought oh, into a, a mindset that almost took away their gift in this world. Yeah. You didn't. And I'm just, like, I'm only emotional because um, I just think it's powerful. So powerful. I, I think of that too. Um, I remember when I was about 11 or 12, I decided I wanted to commit suicide. And um, I did it by mixing all the, um, you know, the Clorox, like all of that. And I put it, poured it all in this cup. And I remember I was like mixing it. And I didn't know that my mom's cousin, my auntie, was watching me. And um, I put it, and so I put it down by my um, pant, like my side, and I was walking out, and she followed me. Then she was like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "Nothing." And she's like, "I saw you. What are you doing?" And I was like, "Nothing." And then she went and told my mom's sister, and so they came and took deep when they were like smelling it, and they're like, "What are you doing, kokole kiki?" You know. But I feel like when I got older and I look back at every all these significant events that happened, I was like damn god only let it go so far and he was like all right that's enough <laughs> like you know i, I never got to the end because yeah. you're right a lot of children a lot of people actually have had these really harsh experiences in their life and it's you know pulled them all the way to the edge and some of them have yeah you know sadly but i'm grateful that god just and i always say that it's god because what else there was nothing else at the time. Everybody else was against me at the time. Mm. So there's nothing else and no one else. It would have been just God. He was the one that would have been like, okay, that's enough of pulling you from there. <laughs> Next one kind of thing. As soon as I get a bit too far, pull me back. Mm. So I'm grateful. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Mm. Real powerful story, journey. Um, and I can see why you are the person you are today. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah you 16 had your first boy you're working at a young age and then you end up at working income and now you have this opportunity to serve the community um i don't know if you oh no, you shared earlier i don't know if you were empathetic with them you're like, oh, <laughs> why are you doing it oh i understand <laughs> was like you should have been in this place, but I know for a fact that the work that you do it was like this. You, you'll go over and beyond for um, anyone that will come in contact with you, and and then now you're pursuing this, um, you know, true business, and, and you're still working as well. But I, I think it's such an amazing story. Like um, people can be um, really impacted by it and know that there is a different. Um, different lane or different path and anyway I say all that and I'm thinking about you got four boys you got four boys and uh, what is it like trying to raise them in this day and age and how different is their life from yours like do you use your your story as a way of trying to change their path or um, or are you trying to give them everything that they that you never had. Yeah. Yeah, I have four boys. Um, I have Demetrius. He's the one turning 19 soon. I have De Niro. He's 15. Detroit, he's 11. And DeAndre, he's four. 
All Ds. All Ds, yeah. <laughs> and all boys have no girls. But a lot of people find it because I share a lot on my personal Instagram and I always talk about my parenting um, ways. And I, because I got a hiding my whole life, I never wanted my kids to get hiding, so I never hit them. But they've turned out to be like the most well-behaved, well-mannered kids. And I always get compliments on them. And I'm very proud of that. Like I'm proud that I could raise kids considering where I came from. But a lot of the time, because I don't hit them at all, but I, I don't, I lecture them. I tell them all about my life and I tell them about, um, what could happen this is my biggest thing so i tell them the story and i'm like so you need to make a choice did you want to go down that path because we've seen what it does to this person or did you go down this path because we also know someone who's achieved you know and so i've taught them that way of life that everything is a choice and if they because they've obviously never experienced not even close to anything in my life and um, I give them real life experiences, mm. but I always try my best to give them the opportunity to make the choice for themselves. Wow. So um, it wasn't always like that. Like before, it was just lectures, but I feel like they've gone a little older now. So I had to change it and sort of, I want them. I, when I was young, I made this vision of what I wanted, the kind of um, mother I wanted to be. And so that has sort of guided me mentally throughout the whole journey of raising these boys and I do I use a whole lot of life experience um, as examples for them Mm. and then um, I now that they're older I give them the opportunity to choose but we do a lot of um, we sit around the table a lot (laughs) they hate it (laughs) when I'm like oh hurry up everyone come around the table they're all like oh man Mom, and they're like, Mom, man, we got we got to get ready in an hour. You only got an hour. <laughs> because I go on for like three hours. <laughs> they're like, Mom, man, hurry up. But, um, and I chose to take them out of South Auckland because, um, well, from a young age, they were always um, busy. Like, they had school. They All my kids have been in daycare from three month, five months old mm-hmm. all the way through. So that's their life. And then... When they're in school, they had like training plus Kumon. So there was never, I decided to keep them busy so that they didn't have time to um, go out onto the street. Mm. Because I knew from experience that the minute you give them a little bit of time and a little bit of freedom, it's over. So I did that. So they were always sort of, um, oh, we have a schedule. Like the friends would come over and knock on our door and I'll like go in the back and I'll be like, Demetrius. And he's like, oh, sorry, bro, we got to go to rugby training. Even if it's not, he'll be like, oh, got to go to rugby training or got to go to this. I just didn't, I knew what I wanted them to, who they wanted, like who I wanted them to be. Mm. And it included, because I have all this life experience from working income, and I saw the example, like with my own eyes, I was like, okay, you're not hanging with them. These are not the type (laughs) of people that I want around you. And I used to control it a lot when they were younger. But I just did it in a way where they didn't think like it was controlled. (laughs) <laughs> like they were making the choice yeah. like I would <laughs> not so say um, you're not allowed to do that so like for example I always tell them um, if you want to drink and you want to do all of that you can when you turn 18 mm. so I made sure that my language was never you're never allowed to try this mm. because that's what why I was like and every time someone said no I would take that as a challenge <laughs> and go and see what it was like so um, just little things like that I took them to Australia and put them in a private school. Mm. <laughs> we used to call them um, like they're brown, but they're real posh. They're like brown <laughs> posh boys. You would never think these boys were raised or born in South Auckland. Wow. But I, I'm, I'm I'm blessed and I'm very glad that I um, God put a desire in me to raise them. I wanted to minimize. I know that you can't always eliminate all trauma, mm. but I wanted to minimize the trauma <laughs> as much as possible yeah. so that um just for their sake so that mm. they can grow up and be great men and do what Beautiful. they want to do as opposed to growing up becoming adults and trying to work through all the trauma that <laughs> I had put them through in their <laughs> life you know I'm one of those mums that I explain to them my decisions so my kids have never slept at anyone's house and like mm. Demetrius is 19 soon Never slept at anyone's house. And now he has no desire to sleep at anyone's house. He just stays home. And I explained to them, like, the things that people do 
to children and what could happen. Mm. And this is my way of keeping them safe because if I'm not there, I can't keep them safe. And if they go through that, it can never be erased from their life. Mm. And it's going to, you know, stuff them up mentally. And that's, that's not the path we're trying to go down. I'm not trying to have extra responsibilities. So, um, and they, over time, they learn and they've accepted it. And so it's so funny because um, when I watch them now, they sort of, um, they do it to each other. Like, they're like, oh, yeah, is that a good decision, eh, bro? <laughs> they're like, oh, you're going to grow up and you're going to be one of those people. <laughs> I'm like, hey, keep it in the house only. <laughs> Don't say that out too loud. But um, I love parenting. It's one of those topics that I can go on and on and on and yeah. on. I spend a lot of... When they were younger, up until 2015, they were always in school and then before and after school care. So I never saw them. So once I finished work in 2015, oh, then I went back to work. But when um, once I finished work and I had a bit of spare time, I would go on their trips. Oh. And I realised then that I had missed a lot of like the school, you know, the school activities. Oh, we couldn't go. We worked nine to five. Yeah. And um, I had prioritised providing for them or for us for so long that I didn't realise that these are the small things that... And so when um, when I even when I went back to work, I would tell them, like, oh, I'm going to my son's um, thing, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and they would just have to accept it because I wouldn't take the job if they didn't. <laughs> and so um, I realised that I wanted to be there. Mm. That's good. And because they're boys, I feel like... I don't know, I don't have any daughters to compare, but I have a lot of, um, all my brothers have daughters. And I feel like um, it's important for me to raise these boys to be like amazing men, like the men that we want, you know, today. Yeah. There's, there's not many amazing men, unfortunately. Um, it's not common, you know. I mean, these are all amazing men, definitely. But like... Um, Why do you think that is? Why do you think we're losing our quality of good men oh my god oh, wait, 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 first of all describe this describe what is, is an amazing man gustavia yeah, that would be cool oh, I think I just cool. don't talk cool. about me yeah. just, <laughs> take off like <laughs> your yeah, I mean, this, this is a good point i think yeah and what carol is saying but i think uh, yeah i think in order for some of them you know what is what is it, if you can describe for us what is an amazing man or what makes an amazing man I think today what makes an amazing man is a man that loves God and follows God. It was funny because I was telling my boys the other time, like I went to Melbourne to see one of my first cousins. And um, when I came back, I was um, talking to them about how to be a man, like what women expect a man um, from a man. And I was telling them, bro, you know, my cousin in Oz, the one in uh, Melbourne, he's like a man, man. Like he does all the manly stuff. He um, leads his family. And whatever he says goes. And um, and I really like, but not in an intimidating way. Like he always consulted his wife, but it was, it was, it was, it was almost like he took his, her advice, but he made the final decision. Mm -hmm. And I really like to see that. And so I was telling them, and then um, I was telling my cousin, oh, I was just using you as an example of what I think is a great man. And he was like, you know what it is, cuz? I love God and I follow God's word and God's word tells me how I need to behave. Wow. And those are the behaviors and the character traits that m what you call a man that you're, that you're describing. Mm. And I thought about it, I was like, yeah, true way. Eh? That is true. <laughs> <laughs> when you're a man of God, you follow exactly how God says a man should yeah. be. You think about it, how everyone describes like an alpha man. That, that is literally what the Bible says yeah. of a man. Yeah. So it's definitely an amazing man as somebody who, loves God and prioritizes God's work and is willing to action the, you know, God's word in terms of what it takes yeah. to be a man. That last bit is key, mm. actioning mm. it. Yeah. I think there's a lot of men that know, they read. go to church and <laughs> read the Bible. Yeah, that's so important is the actioning part. So my question now? Oh, yeah. No, you, you, you finish with the question. Yeah. yeah. Because you're an entrepreneur, you've seen this problem and you've created a solution. You're raising these boys up because you've seen a problem. <laughs> You're raising them up in a certain way. And I'm hearing you have routine for them. You tell a nod to them. You explain why, where you're coming from, what are the options, what are the consequences. And you also give them their independence and autonomy to, you know, take what you've said and consider it. So you're 
and you had a vision board for yourself as a uh, as a mum and how you would parent. And this has come about because you've seen what's happened to our men and you want these men to be great. And I, I just absolutely love that. Um, so we have that desire for our sons because something's happened, eh? Something's happened to our, the quality of our men. Yeah, yeah. I... I had this discussion with a friend before and um, (laughs) I was saying, I believe in the Polynesian cultures especially, women are the backbone of the family. Like the mums run the show, you know, they um, they even tell the men, the husbands, like what to do, how to do, and the the men do it, but it comes from the woman. And I feel like um, as sons, like women do everything for their sons. And then they get their daughters to do everything for the sons. I'm not sure why, but I saw that a lot growing up. And like you hear about it today, they're like, oh, like I seen on TikTok where they're like, um, you know, poly is that the um, the girls have to do everything in case because they need to learn how to be a wife. But the, <laughs> the boys are all good. Like they're, they're like the princess of the family. And I feel like because those boys have been raised that way where they respect the mom. The mum makes all the decisions. Whatever mum says go, they then shift that onto the wife. And it's like, oh, yeah, whatever my wife says go. I'll give all that responsibility to my wife because I grew up in the mum. And I don't know if they see it as a respect or if they're just like fobbing off their responsibilities. But I feel like the whole (laughs) guy submitting to the wife is a result of how our boys are raised because Mm. If the boys were raised the way girls are, like where the girls have to, you know, the girls have to do a lot of the fields. Mm. And I heard this a lot growing up, not in my family, but the families that we grew up in, around, as they'll say, um, go do the ganga meal, or go do the ipus because, you know, they say <laughs> that. And I always thought, oh, that's, you know, no, show. that's how you do it. Mm. And then I got on and I was like, oh, hell no. They're just creating women who do everything mm. and um, guys who can chill. And I feel like um, <laughs> when I get mad at my kids, I'm like, do you want to be like girls or do you want to be boys? <laughs> like, <laughs> this isn't, that's not how it works, you know, that kind of, But I feel like that's kind of, in my opinion, where it stems from this whole, um, yeah. the boys passing on the responsibility to their wives is that's how they were raised. They yeah. weren't raised how to be men and how to get out there and do all the fails and that kind of thing. Mm. So, yeah, I don't know, that's just my opinion. Yeah, because it's true. Eh? From a um, female perspective, we are. We um, it's like the boys are always given special treatment, and you know we're always given the extra responsibilities. Um, and you can see how that might transfer over, possibly. Um, being very careful because we're on a men's yes, um, yes. podcast. <laughs> I know, carry on, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> this is just my opinion. <laughs> no, that's cool. No, I, like but it. I also <laughs> see that you know there's an issue with our non pacifica men. You know, there's True. an issue right across the world, and while well, that might be happening in our um, cultural surroundings, um, but there's also a problem out there too. And sometimes I see sitcoms, you know, where they have like the man's really fat. And drinking a beer and sitting on the couch and the woman's like skinny and pretty and I'm like, what are you guys doing? Like, what are you guys trying to convey here? Like, and I and I sometimes wonder, are they trying to? What are they doing to the role of the man? Like, when they portray them in these sitcoms and that kind of manner. Mm, mm. So you're right in our cultural context. Yeah, we, I get where you're coming from because I used to always get frustrated. Like the guys can go play and we have to stay in the house. Yeah. And they always, you always feel like they're fuck bellying the um the boys. the boys, and then you get older, and it's like, hey, um, <laughs> yeah, it, I feel like it doesn't help them when they get older, but also, um, I feel like society standards is where, um, and I say poly because obviously we're poly and we're very familiar with our culture, yeah. is that um, the girl's job, you know, the wife does everything and the guy works. So that's sort of like the mentality that society had back then is that the man's job is to work and provide for the family. The woman's job is to raise the kids and look after the house and do all of that. And I feel like somehow unintentionally it got ingrained into our the generation of our mm. ancestors to the point that that's how they raise the kids. Yeah. Because nowadays it's a bit different. Like people raise children all sorts of different ways. But that was, 
I yeah, when we had that conversation, I had that discussion with one of my friends. I was like, Did she share the same mm-hmm. viewpoint, or did she have something? And she different? was like, Oh, I never thought about that, but now that I am, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you reckon we should hear what these guys are doing? Oh, they, yeah, they, they I mean, like I'd love to hear at the, at the um, seams no, right I think, now. I think it's good. I think you, your, your opinion, um, Gustav, yeah, that's, that's cool. And you're right. I think because I was the only boy, only boy in my, mm. in my household. And in terms of, and you talk about cultural. Um, appropriateness that the girls were like yeah okay you do the fials you do the this and that and and to be honest and, and just um answering what you just said is that yeah i was kind of treated like hey now nah, this is this is the golden boy yeah this is the golden boy because he's, he's the only boy and i had uh, four sisters and then i had uh, other people who come into our household and they, they lived with us from overseas and it was the same thing and and, and i think that's true to a point in terms of okay don't, don't, don't touch that don't you can't do that because you, you know and i think for me personally i kind of grew up like oh and i kind of kind of Kind of, kind of dented me for, for, for a bit because I kind of grew up like, oh, no, I, shouldn't, I can't do this. Because if I do this, I might get in trouble. And, and because you know, the household said, no, you don't do, don't do that kind of stuff. But I think there comes a point in, in my life, I'm talking about myself uh, personally, is that you have to, a man, it's, it's when there's nothing there, you have nothing, your back's against the wall, no one to support you, no one's got your back. When you, me as a person, as a man, you have to get up on your, on your ten toes and say, hey, you got to take responsibility. Mm. And I totally agree what you're saying in terms of uh, our, our poly men or poly families that there's been a bit of a, okay, the woman's role is do the fails, look after the man, do the, all the stuff, and then men just provide and work and all that kind of stuff. But I think the, the onus really comes back down to our men in terms of saying, hey, I can't be doing this. Mm. I, can't be, I can't be just kind of going along with what has been taught, regardless if it's culture or not culture or if it's biblical. Um, but... A, there comes a point in a man's life when you go, you know what? I need to stand up on my own two feet. Yeah, I need to grow up. Uh, and I, I need to do things on my own and take responsibility and take the onus back and say, hey, I'm a man. And if I can't do that, and if I got my, my boys who are watching or my son watching me do this, and then how is the repercussion of, of me not growing up and being a real man in this day and age going to affect my son? Mm. I, can, I, can, I can imagine, I can imagine our boys, if uh, us as men, Charles, Jamin, Brad, myself, if if that's the way it is, and we're gonna go 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 with it, and no go and I'm gonna get, no go against the grain, it's gonna be a cycle. It's gonna be an everlasting cycle where our men, a lot of detrimental stuff, and our men are not gonna be men. And when the going gets tough, the tough are not, is not gonna be there. The tough is not gonna get going. Yeah, and that's so, true. Yeah, I I agree. A godly man is is a, is a man who's gonna take take charge and say, hey, I need to change things, uh, and know for a fact that. I'm, I'm the one who's responsible. I need to take charge. I need to be the man to, to, to go forth and press forward and to do things, not only for myself, but for my for my house or for my family. And so, yeah, because I, I understand what you say. I, I tell you, because I can say, oh, and, I, and it's always a bit of a joke in my family. Oh, no, he, he's, the, he's the golden boy. Yeah. <laughs> Leave him. Um, but there, there comes a time where, as, as boys, and this one is, the word is boys, where boys end up being men, need to grow up yeah. to be men. Um, but I don't know uh, the, for for Charles and Jay, uh, they might have different perspectives. But oh, I never had that problem. Me, I was <laughs> born a man. <laughs> <laughs> You're born with a beard. He's a bad child. He's a bad child. Before, before I answer, I'll probably ask my wife because she's in the room. Um, did you come to that understanding before you um, got with Caroline, or before you were married, or during the marriage? Because I want, yeah, yeah. Oh, answer. It's a good question, Uzo, because for the longest time when I was growing up, I was, and I, I used to tell my wife this all the time, I always wanted to do things. I wanted to try things. Oh, but yeah. I used to want to do things. Hey, I'm going. If you're a buckle, hey, mm. call me out. And all that kind of stuff. Oh, shucks. I'll, I'll get in trouble. Now, I remember vividly, I was trying to help my, my uncle. He was a mechanic. I wanted to help out. I oh, want help out with the men and just get involved with the men and just mm. help out. So I was trying to help, I don't know, something underneath the, the, the bonnet and the engine. So I was trying to help out. And my uncle goes, shh, shh, hey. Say, get, yeah, get out yeah. like, oh, so man, and that was kind of like the, oh. so, and, and I felt like, you know, I tried to try to do things, but the thing was, I wanted to do it, oh. you know, I wanted to do, do things on my own and give it a go, but no, 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 don't, don't touch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I see it, I see it um, in, in, in other boys. I see the, the same thing that's, that's happening. No, no, don't, don't, don't touch that. No, she can do that. No, don't do that. Mm. And what happens is that, I, what, what I believe is that what happens with your, your, your question, I'm Charles, that. Because you've been saying no, don't do that, and you become accustomed, so accustomed to, mm-hmm. don't do this. You know, you leave it to them, leave it to your sister, leave it to whoever. 
that it, it really kind of uh, it's quite detrimental for us as a, as, as, as as boys, you know, because you want to do things and then it kind of like oh you can't do it, and then for for the longest time I remember my mind is thinking oh, I can't do it, I shouldn't be able to do it here. Yeah. And I played on my and played on my psyche and my, my mental. Oh, I shouldn't. I shouldn't try this because I can't do it. But in terms of the, the day, I knew like is when I wow. Oh, so, yeah, when I started kind of like okay, seeing all the other guys and doing things. I'm like, I want to do that. I want to give it a go. And then I, obviously Caroline, and I felt like man, there's a lot of freedom when you step out and say, you know what, I can actually do this. And when you do it, like oh man, I can't do it. <laughs> so and and it's a, it's part and I think I believe it's part and process of, of being a man is. It's finding it for yourself that you can actually do these things on your own, and when you do it, like you're saying, faith, you know, faith without works is death, is dead. And so, if you don't do it, you, you're never going to know. And so, yeah, I kind of in my late teens, I kind of realized, wow, oh, I can actually do things on my own, and I don't have to wait for people and and be babied to to do these things. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I'm that that that's an awesome insight from what Gus had shared in terms of like uh, the our ancestors or our older generation where the men, you know, uh, or the boys when they grow up, sisters and the woman and the mother's doing everything. And then when we, and so decisions are also getting made for you, we're just taught to um, prepare for work. And then when you get, because of the models of us, um, the ones we looked up to in terms of what a man should look like is you go work and, you do the work and you put food on the table and then that's it. And so that's what, and so when you get into a relationship, it's like my understanding from what your insight was, is that men can't make decisions. So it's always mm. put on the, the partners like, Oh, she's got it. Uh, I'm, I'm working. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll put food, food on the table. And I'm just wondering, cause I'm trying to, f I'm trying to look back at my journey and I'm going to quickly ask my wife because sometimes when you go through like a transformation, um, you sort of forget the journey because you, mm. you're like, man, you know, uh, you you pick up new ways of living and uh, hopefully I've, I'm, I'm, I've changed and I'm, I'm learning to be a man. But one, uh, you can nod your head if like in our early stages, was I like that? Like in terms of like I couldn't make decisions like you're the can can I get a yes? yes. <laughs> and so like I you know in my early and now in our early years of our marriage, that's all I did was I'll go work, work these long hours, and I felt like yeah I'm providing, but I never spent time with my daughter. Uh, my wife did everything, and I got to go out and. My downtime was with the boys, and I thought that was being a man. But my, uh, we can look back now, and my wife was, man, she was going through all the stuff. Like she went through uh, postnatal depression because I was hardly around. <laughs> I was useless. Um, or when I look back, yeah, I was useless, and she made all the decisions. And there was times I couldn't make decisions because I was always. I was always like, um, I I let her um, be, and I let her do everything because my reliance was on her or the resp I never saw it that way, and now when I think of it, think of it, it's like yeah, all the res responsibility was on her, but it wasn't until yeah the faith journey when I learned mm -hmm. how to be a man. For what the word would say, like love. Uh, love my wife as if Jesus loved the church mm. and that would die for the church. And in order for me to understand this, to understand the way Jesus lived and how we would love his people and through grace and uh, learning that, man, my, that that's not a man just going to work. I had to build a, you know, I had to care. I had to do stuff around the house. I, I, I only knew how to make um, toasties and eggs. Um, Last year. <laughs> no, that, that's the only thing I, I knew how to do when um we when we were together. I would I, I would always make the breakfast, and I had to learn how to cook in my early twenties. <laughs> and now my kids love my cooking more than hers. Nah, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But yeah, so, yeah. But so I, lo I, I love that because I never saw it that way. Like um, 
and that that makes sense to me because I was like, yeah, you're right. It's <laughs> when we get older, we put a lot of responsibility on our partners, and then there's always this miscommunication. Because by the sounds of it, it sounds like women want that, yeah, that mm. man to take charge, <laughs> to, lead. to lead. It's like, why wow, you? You're the man. You yeah. make the decision, yeah. and and even though our women are independent and are strong, it's like. No, we're meant to we're meant to be the the head of the house. Anyway, there's just all those cool, waffling words. Yeah, cool. Cool. But the best piece of advice I got was from this lady, and I always mocked my mate for it because it was his grandma. She walked in and she was talking to all the boys that were in the room, and she was going, she, um, "I'm gonna call out my mate and um, pass the fill." Um, <laughs> you would call out you guys, son. You know you are the head of the family. You're the head. You you got to lead, but without but your wife, the our, our partners are the neck. Okay, they're the wisdom. Okay, you cannot lead or or um, direct without the neck turning. Because have you ever seen someone try walking in the direction and um and you can't turn your neck? You look like an idiot, eh? and so you need the neck, <laughs> the neck to help the head turn. And I always took that um, from when, even though we were laughing about it, we're like ah, but it was such good wisdom because it's like, yeah, we're the head of the family, we're meant to lead, but without the neck, um, listening to the neck, being wise and helping us with the direction, and there's no connection, then we can't really lead um, as a family, so. I don't know, I've done a lot of talking. Jay, your turn. <laughs> Tell us your trauma. That's cool. That's, 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 uh, awesome. 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 Um, yeah, it's a really interesting conversation. It's funny, I was just thinking, does me and Brad are brothers. Oh. Um, and so, the, you know, we're a family of eight. I'm the eldest, and Brad's number three in our family. And there's six boys, two girls. And so we weren't raised very close to either side of the culture. Um, but in our household, I always found that it was the girls that got, you know, the easier track because they were part of the younger bunch. So the older oh, bunch, we yeah. all got the hard mum and dad trial and error. Yeah. And then as mum and dad matured, they realised what they wanted to give us. And because we'd grown up by then, they gave it to the younger ones. And so I think our division has always been the older versus the younger. And um, I think something that came to mind for me was just resilience. Like I'm grateful for how hard it was and I'm, I'm grateful for your experience in terms of wanting to be present because I've recently found myself on that journey of wanting to provide um, and then as soon as you know with, I've finished my studies now as a teacher um, I realize now that it's it's actually those little memories mm. it's the memories I don't have of my parents not being there that scarred me the most and I only realized that because of therapy um, and so when I think about what it means to be a man now um, I think Similar to the boys, it's about backing yourself, taking action. Um, and literally, I was talking to Caroline before the show. We recently had a tonguey, so I haven't been here for the last couple of weeks mm. when we filmed. And um, I had an epiphany about the tonguey that we had and it was about finding answers in forgotten spaces. And that actually everything that I need, I already have. Whether it's an experience, a memory, or something currently in my home right now, I have everything I need. All I got to do is sift through it and find mm. it. But because of that little thought, it's helped me back myself. And I realize now that me and my wife, we operate at different speeds where she's quite cautious and mindful of everything. I'm quite ambitious and I, I like to move quick and make decisions and do things. But I'd kind of lost it over the last few yeah. years because throughout my studies, it just the story of society is that everyone matters, but almost to the point of you stand still. It takes way longer to do something because you have to account for everyone. Yeah. Everyone has a say. And unless you have everyone say, if you press forward without everyone having a say, then you're not doing it right. And I think I'd lost a bit of that whole, you know, back myself until this recent tangy. So for me, being a man is about having direction and the perspective that life is an adventure. I think when you are self-aware enough to know that it's an adventure, then who cares yeah. if you make a mistake? Who cares if you fall down? Who cares what other people say? It's an adventure. It's part of the journey. It's part of your story. We just press forward. And um, life's never been 
so exciting now that I've had that realization about myself and understanding that actually my wife didn't want to be included in every conversation because I'd always like force her to choose and she's just not the that's not yeah. her personality. But because I thought I was doing the right thing, like putting her on the spot, not only did it stall and frustrate me and our family, it actually made her really anxious and it diminished her confidence because she didn't want to be put in that position and I was putting her there against her will, thinking I was some sort of white knight crusader saviour. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, it's just backing myself. Um, and again, having that sense of direction that comes from my wife. She keeps me in check. But now I feel like I can lead our house, our two young children, and the future's never been so exciting. Mm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. like that. Look what you've just opened. <laughs> well, this, 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 uh, <laughs> but it makes you think, though, in terms of the cultural um, aspect, like before the westernization before um those guys would come from different parts of the of the, of the world yeah you know, it makes you think yeah because because yeah, like, it's, it's a good good question uh, good insights in terms of what was it really like were the were the men and women in terms of uh the different roles uh obviously it would have been har harmonious back in the but because of societal pressures because of the westernized yeah. culture and because of the different yeah. ways of different perspectives of how we live in the western world that maybe some of that stuff is kind of we've, we've, we've grasped some other stuff and then they're like oh well this is how it should be so we'll just try and mold it into the westernized yeah. world and then this is how we should try to protect our men or whatever because i can think of countless men back in the uh, you know i'm talking about early 1900s and so more the mole uh, mm. like these, these, these were men. These were men who were doing some amazing things, uh, going against um, uh, colonization, against um, New, uh, obviously New Zealand back in the day, and America and Germany, and and then other women would follow through or follow um, with with the mole. So maybe maybe that has kind of played a big part in terms of uh, molding our men and, and kind of changing the the cultural aspect in terms of women do this. Men do this. Yeah. So maybe I don't know. There's something to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Insights, eh? Yeah. Yeah, man, <laughs> that was good, man. Well, I'm just for opening up a Pandora box. But <laughs> <laughs> Which does um, lead me to, because you've been um, that mum that's been on this journey, you know, been providing, um, showing your kids how to live your dream out, um, which means it comes at a cost. And the cost is the time yep. with your boys, which is why I can also hear, man, when you're with your boys, man, three hours on that table, <laughs> <laughs> making up for last time. Um, when you're on that plane and you're traveling overseas for however long amount of time, and I know you've got it all organized and you've got the routines going, um, is that your plan? Is that how you've tried to keep them busy? Um, like, I guess I'm just, my question is really around, you you know what the trade off is, eh? And how have you sort of um, managed the 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 cost of you not being there? Is it through the talking through the routine? Or I, th I think it is. When I'm there, I am I'm very present. Yeah, mm. I'm always with um, my kids to the point people think I'm a single mom <laughs> 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 because it's always just me and the boys all the time. That's like so cool. I'm always there. Um, so I, they know when I go because I haven't actually been traveling too much for business. I only go for weekends. Oh. So, um, I've been away every single month this year, I think by February. Um, but I usually only go for a weekend. Oh, cool. So you've yeah. just slimmed so it right I down. So I try and, yeah. yeah. Like I always tell myself if it's not for business, if it's only for leisure, then I only can go for the weekend. Yeah. But, um, if it's for business, then that's fine. Like I can justify that. They know that I have to work. Mm. And they know what I'm trying to achieve because I talk to them about our vision cool. and we have like a family vision of where we see ourselves, how we want to live and um, all of that. Like we go very much into detail Nice. and I, I always give them an opportunity to speak. And um, it was funny because when they were really young, I used to say to them, if there's anything you're not happy with, you can say it. And, you know, their dad, he, they used to be like, oh, dad, you need to get off your phone. They'll never say it to me. Um, that's because they always assumed I was doing work on my yes. phone. They wouldn't know that I was scrolling. <laughs> and they'll be like, Dad, you need to spend more time with us. And um, and because I do the pickups and the drop-offs. yeah. So I'm like the person they see before they go to school, the person they see after they go to school. 
at the training because their dad works full time at the train, and um, it just got to a point where I enjoyed it. So I try and make sure that I'm at everything, and um, and if I'm not, I have to actually answer to them. Like they're like, "Well, what were you up to today? How come you couldn't come and watch my like that?" Kind of they'll ask me. Oh wow! Well, what were you doing there? You were so busy, you couldn't come and watch my game. Or <laughs> So um, I try and make sure that I'm present and I know, it, it, yeah, that sort of makes up, in my mind, yeah. makes up for the time that I'm away. Like I've been away for a whole week and um, it's funny because when I learned to let go when I'm not there, so in the sense that um, I have to let their dad do things their ways because, you know, obviously mums have, have certain ways of doing things and mums like to have things done properly and, um, you know, like, for example, even if I'm away, I want them to hang the laundry in a certain way and in categories. <laughs> but to all just, um, their dad is to all, he just allows them to throw it up on the, you know, on the clothing yeah, line. And it. I hate that. Yeah. But I'm like, it's okay. But I just let him run it the way yeah. he sees fit until I'm back again. And, and that was, weird. yeah, that was probably the hardest thing. But I feel like now as they're getting older, they know that this is the way that things have to be done. Yeah. So even if I'm not there, they get it done. Like I rang my eldest son and I was like, what are you up to? And he was like, oh, I'm just um, making sure I clean the kitchen before I cook. You know, like things like that. So I'm like, oh, yeah, you're getting it. Yeah. <laughs> so nice. some of the stuff is like sitting in. But I always give them an opportunity to have their say. Yeah. Even today. And I told myself, even if it hurts, I have to listen mm. and I always try and make adjustments to my attitude, unless it's them, like um, to my attitude and my perspective um, to, you know, to, you want your kids to um, live a good life, like a happy life, but I also want them to feel like they're heard yeah. and they're loved. And part of feeling that you're loved is that you are being heard. Like you feel like, oh yeah, my mom understands me. And the hardest thing is that you have four kids. They're all very different. They all have different needs. They all see things differently. So it's trying to like juggle it to make sure. So we all, that's why we do a lot of around the table stuff yeah. so that everyone can say what they need to say. And then I'll say whatever, have to yeah. try and. Do, do you have a fine line between business and family or is it like that? Like it just totally overlaps. And when it overlaps, do you get your children to give you perspective on your business ideas and. Um, how you run it, or just sometimes I'll products? ask them for their opinion. Cool, but um, like I noticed, <laughs> I'll ask them for their opinion on shoes, and then I realized they didn't even like high heels. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you're the wrong people to ask. So <laughs> they, I don't bother us, but they help me. Like they they know how to pack. Mm. Uh, my older son does the invoices sometimes. Mm. Um, he like does some design. I could not design to save my life, so I have to hire people to do the designing. And um, my son's one of them, so I um, use their talents and their strengths in the business. So yeah. I try and build it up and free labour. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's so important. And the reason I'm asking this is that as an entrepreneur um, who is having to trade time, um, and your oldest is 19, so I can imagine the oldest got to see a lot of yeah. absence. Um, because uh, it got to see a lot of abs absence, but because you were explaining to him what you were doing, he had a vision board, he was part of the development of that vision. And I think it's important for people to, who want to get into this line of uh, or into owning their own business that they, you know, for some, you know, there's that trade off of being present, yeah, um, and not being present, and or being. We had one guy who came on the podcast, Johnny Timu, and he was like created this uproar and he was like I'm going to be the the dad who's going to be a provider at the cost of being present oh, and yeah. a year later he's like no 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 <laughs> I <laughs> want to be the present dad <laughs> yeah yeah because I know how to provide and not be there and I'm like yeah. you're the man bro after a year later as a business owner himself yeah. he's been able to figure that out and I'm like that's so cool and so I for some people who might want to get into the space you know they that's another barrier sometimes yeah. is just, I'm just, I've just had kids yeah. and I've got to now spend all this time over here. Like, how do I balance that? And I love what you've just said. Bring them as part of it. Yeah. Get them part of the vision. We now have a vision. Now that they're older, they can be. Yeah. They're all part of it. And um, I think that helps. Like, I, so my third son, he was the one Detroit. He was the one that when he turned one, that's when I started traveling and I was never in the country. <laughs> 
And so um, him and his dad were really, really, really close. And I only felt a type of way when I went to, I think I went to New York and I noticed that he was starting to cling on to my sister-in-law, my brother's wife. And I was like, oh, it must be just because um, I'm, I'm not there. But when I came back, he, I noticed that he wanted to sort of go to that sister-in-law. And I was like, oh, okay, this is the part of business that I don't like. <laughs> yeah. Um, is that my kids wanted to go to other people because I'm never here. Mm. But I think he kind of grew out of it as he got older. And I take them on trips, like pre-COVID, we took, I would take them on um, our annual trips to where I go. <laughs> That's cool. So they could see it. So they can see like, oh yeah, this is our factory and this is where this is where I'm always at and that's the house I stayed in when I came. And I think for them to see it, they're like, Oh, okay, so she does actually work. Like she's not just travelling to go to and, and yeah, and hang out and so That's cool. That's so cool. And I think it's important for people to know that that's yeah. how you sort of keep that balance. Mm. So important. So how did you um manage to buffer that whole thing with your third son? Oh, I think he just grew out of it. When I came back, because I wasn't working full-time, like it was just a business. Yeah. Oh, actually, no. I was still working full-time. I just, um, I, when, I'm, when I'm back, I try my best to spend yeah. all my time with him. <laughs> make up yeah, for it. To I make mean, up for it. Yeah. That's and cool. then, yeah, that's kind of the only way. Because when I go to China, I stay there for like three months. Really? <laughs> Jeepers, that is a long trip. I thought you were like talking a few days. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, if it's production time, I'll stay there for three months. Oh, wow. That's how long I was allowed to stay overseas, like in a certain country without yeah. a visa. Wow. So. Those are long periods, yeah. eh? Really long. Heaps of video calls. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think the, ki- the kids don't even want to talk to you when you're gone, you know? Yeah, like They get used to it. Yeah, they get so used to it. They're just like, hi, mom. And, and then that's you come it. home and they're like, She's and they're like, did you bring me anything? Like, that's all they're true. worried about. It's true. What's in the bag? Mm-hmm. Man, honestly, thank you so much for sharing so much wisdom and a lot of your life um, story. I think there's plenty there to gain um, for our listeners, but also just for us as individuals. Um, um, I'm also mindful of time because I know it's getting late. I did have one last question for you. Um, you know, you've come through a lot, your journey... Uh, in your journey you also mentioned that you can find a shortcut for anything <laughs> so when you reflect back on your life and getting to this part um, in particular regarding your business endeavors are there parts of your journey where you're like actually I could shortcut that if I was to live my life again I could probably do without this section and still take the learning in some other way um, uh, is there a part of your journey that you would shortcut next time um Probably not, only because I feel like every time I had to go through something or I had to do something, I learned the process. And once I learned the process, it was then that I was like, ah, okay, next time. And then the very next time I'll do the shortcut. So um, I feel like I had to learn the process so that I can find the shortcut. Yeah. But um, if I was to go back and change it, I probably wouldn't because then I wouldn't know how to work and how to um, get around it. (laughs) That's the Beautiful. Secret, eh? yeah. Yeah. Learn the hard way yeah. and, then and then do the shortcuts. Love that. No worries. Mm. Thank you so cool. much. Thank you. It'll be like shortcutting the process, eh? Mm. Yeah, good on you. That's a good, good, good answer. I have so many questions about your business. Um, I know this. I've always been encouraging you, and I know yeah. that you're, um, you're gonna just you're gonna go get into it in terms of podcasting, and I reckon you'll go off of you being you and and some of these life hacks you have. Um, what are three life hacks that you have like in terms of sh- you've learned you want you got all these shortcuts and stuff what are three I call it life hacks what are three life hacks that people can learn from you and th- 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 it could be anything what are some <laughs> off the top of my head um, I, I got one that maybe yeah to get out of a parking fine <laughs> <laughs> what's a life hack what's the hack I always um my life hack for getting out of everything is going straight to the top I bypass any kind of process any when when I was working at working income I learned that um if you go to the top you get what you want and I was, and from there I adapted that into my life so cool. if I want to get out of parking tickets I just write to the um CEO of the 
Brisbane City Council. <laughs> <laughs> they all know me now. <laughs> the government knows me very well. I'm sure by now when they see my name, they flag it red and they're like, put that in the bin. Don't answer her email. <laughs> that would probably be my number one hack. Number Always go, go to, to the, the top. top. Yeah, don't worry about the processes. You know, you think about it. Humans are like us, like someone, our fellow cousin or whatever, colleague created these policies. So if people created it, surely we can bypass it. Yeah. What's another situation that we've got into and try to get out of? I'm trying to think. Um, another one is, um, and this is not like a negative, um, is uh, never like... I think when I was younger, I used to explain a lot. And then when I got older, I realised, oh, that's how you get yourself into trouble. So you kind of <laughs> so you don't, leave. yeah, Straight you say as very no, little no. as possible without admitting to anything. <laughs> I know that sounds very difficult, but like, for example, with the parking fines, I just, I don't admit that I was there. I don't, you know, like I, I go around it and I, and I sort of put it back on them. Like I asked them, do you have proof? Because I know they don't. And I'm like, do you have proof then? No? Okay, well then get me out. Well, the same thing um, apply for if you have an overdue um, warrant and rego. Can you get out of that? What's a oh, warrant and rego? So, you know, because, you know, back in Oz, we don't do warrants. We just have um, the one warrant to get the whole car registered. And then after that, it's just every registration. But, um. <laughs> what about speeding t- ticket? Speeding fines? Oh, I challenge everything. <laughs> straight to the top I challenge <laughs> everything to the top. The middle, middle yeah. Yeah. If I look at something And I feel like I, I, I don't want it Not so much um, I didn't do it It's just I don't want it anymore <laughs> I don't want to pay that Then I will write to the top <laughs> And I will, I, will, I will put it back on them To show me evidence that That was me or that um, You know their camera Show me which part of your camera Can you know got them Got my speed because in my eyes, I was speeding 10 k's less than what you were saying, so. <laughs> so just a little, um, before Gus starts her podcast, um, any of you viewers have any such situ- sticky situations you're in? Um, DM us and we'll <laughs> ask Gus, we'll do a video call to her and she'll help you get up. <laughs> I, I, I just like challenges. Yeah. So oh, no. I feel like. Um, and winning them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I don't like to lose ever. Even though um, we try and be humble, I feel like you can be a humble winner. <laughs> you always oh, find sure. a way. For sure. Always, always find, find a way. way. Yeah. Cool. yeah. My all of us is, um, yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Just, yeah. I think just hearing your, your journey and uh, obviously the speed bumps, I, I think a lot of people kind of like, oh, we want to hear the struggle as well. But I think in this, in this um, Talonoa, just hearing your successes has just been really outstanding. Uh, and thank you for being honest and, and open with um, you know, the past and all, all the trauma that happened in the past, but more so your successes uh, and also f- uh, just the telling all around your your boys. I think it's been quite um you know I, I, we have a motto our motto is refine, unlock, and take charge. Uh, but it's also it's, it's been refreshing because it's helped us. Uh, I think hey, uh, also just to kind of share a little bit about ourselves as well. Some of the things that we kind of don't really kind of touch on is is during the podcast and took a woman to, to kind of get us <laughs> open up and say, oh, okay, maybe that's true. Maybe there's some truth to that. And then I think it's awesome just to, for us to, to be challenged as well mm. uh, and just to be open mind, like, oh, maybe there's some truth to that. And also for us to kind of really think, oh, maybe maybe there's some truth and maybe I need to adjust and, and, and so forth. Because the whole thing is, uh, you know, the whole premise is to encourage and inspire men of all walks uh, but if we we can't ex- we can't inspire them or motivate them if we're not inspired ourselves, and if we're not mm. changing ourselves, and so thank you for your telling all, thank you for your journey, thank you for your sharing, thank you for the things that you've 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 you've, you've done. But I'm also, I look forward to your 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 the future, what the future holds. Yeah. All the best thank with you. your endeavors, and continue to do some, continue to do great things, and, and amazing feats. And so we we just really we're really blessed tonight. Yeah. Oh, thank you guys. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Actually, I really enjoyed that. I just um, can I just le- say one thing to finish off with. Um, recently, my kids and I um, were reading. I don't even know how to say this in English. I think it's Habakkuk. Is that how you say yeah. it? It's it's it's, it's one oh, of the yeah, Bible. The books, the books, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I think it's like chapter two, and um, it says how um, 
I can't even remember the name of the guy, but the guy in the in the story goes up to ask God for an answer. And um, God said, like, to write a vision, write the vision down and write it on, like, um, clay, like, you know, concrete. And then, but he said that um, your hard work, they, it will come, like, if you work hard, basically what we took from it is that there's no such thing as if you work hard, you won't achieve. It may take time, mm. but if you actually work hard, you will achieve. So there's no other way to achieve the success other than working hard. And you can never not achieve because if you put in the work, eventually the success is going to come. So mm. a lot of people are um, a bit scared or they get a bit impatient when you're working so hard and you're like, what's happening? But honestly, it just takes like one small thing, one small door to open and then it's the rest is like you know history so mm. that was know. something that um that i love and that i carry and that i think about a lot about hard work so true or equals yeah. success no matter what yeah it will come so, not failure yeah yeah so true so true so thank you so much man what a well-rounded conversation I mean, I haven't finished my questions, but it looks like we have to come to an end. Um, oh, there's so much um, I still want to learn about you. And um, I guess as a businesswoman, as a woman who balances all of these different things, um, and, you know, just thank you for sharing your story and giving us the backdrop. Um, and it's such a big reason why. It's almost as, you know, as tragic, I don't know if that's the right word, I also, however way you describe it, I also see it as being a gift, mm, you know, in, yeah, a, in a way where you've been able to take all of these learnings and all of these, um, the experience, the skills, the risk taking, the adapting, you know, the just being flexible during all these moments, trying to figure out ways to calm yourself down when this is what's coming at your way the whole time. In a way, it's also a gift. And um, mm. I just love how you've taken that into your motherhood role, to your role as a wife, a daughter, to your mum, I hear she's still a big part of your life. Yep. Your yep. siblings, your nieces and nephews. God, oh, you're awesome. Oh, <laughs> you're so awesome. Thank you. Uh, and as a businesswoman too, and I'm so proud of you. So proud of you because um, you said right from the beginning, you're a brown woman from South Auckland. Everything's against you. And you're like, nah, nah, not me. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much for tonight. No, thank you um, for having me. We need part two. No, this one, um, different for me only because I know you outside of this podcast. Usually the guests we have on, um, we only know them from afar. And um, so having you on is um, quite um, special. And so as a brother, um, really proud of you um, seeing the journey and you know the journey hasn't ended and God still has his hand on you and um, and just want all the best for you and yeah it's been amazing just hearing your insight um, um, I always think about the young Gustavia or the Gustavias that are in our hood because I know how passionate you are about where we were from man. and I my prayers that you know the girls and boys from our area get to choose a different path that their circumstances do not define them, mm. and that they can actually overcome and and live a life that's um, outside of their circumstances. So I thank you for living that out and also being real. One thing I know about you is that you're real. You're always the same, and that you. Um, uh, have your heart on your sleeve, and so, and yeah, I, I'm just grateful for for the journey, and I can't wait for what's next because you know, you still, you, you st still haven't scraped the surf surface. So, mm -hmm. I know years from now we're gonna hear uh, Stavias all over the world, and um, yeah, and so I'm glad that um, we've had you tonight, and gonna. You know, we have to have a part two. So next time you're here partying at the next festival, yeah. well, I'll probably be partying at the next um, conference. Um, Pastor Chris, um, tell your daughter to um, come and speak at the next conference. But um, yeah, uh, bless you. Thank Always you. remember the promise that um, not 
not only the promise that you had given God, but the promises that He has over your life, because yeah. the things that you have, that He has allowed you to go through, is um, a testimony for others to to see, mm. and so they can um, know that there is a God that um, that we serve. So, love you, sis. Love your family, thank and you. thank you so much for tonight. Appreciate mm, it. My Lord, lover. Sorry, sis. We always have. Um, we always give our guest a gift. Oh. So we always do a bit of a caric- uh, caricature, a bit of a cartoon uh, of our guests and how we envision them to be. So on behalf of the team, also a box of chocolates as well. So on behalf of the, the Mandate team, this is for you. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Uh, love <laughs> oh, cool. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, but Gustavi, is it, it, well, before we conclude, is there anyone that you can think of that would be ideal to come on the podcast? Anyone that you think could be, I don't know, over the ditch or here in New Zealand or even in China somewhere. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it would be really good to come on the podcast. Um, I think someone that all of our youngins sort of look up to today who's kind of gone against the grain that I um, know probably w- that I haven't seen on your show actually from Brisbane would be um, Lisi. Yes. Trying to hit up the also. I've been trying to hit the also. Oh, oh, I know he's been, he's been busy. I know he's, he, he was in the Homelands um, Festival on the weekend, but the man's been busy. Yeah, so, he'll, be, uh, he'll be mean to have on. Yeah. 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 I think um, a lot more younger ones will mm. be able to relate, relate to his. Yeah. He's cool. real, um, like he's a real awesome guy. Cool. Awesome. Uh, really uh, thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you once again for your time, but always give the other guests the, the last words of encouragement. So, any words of encouragement for the viewers and the listeners? Um, doesn't matter what, how high um, or like what you achieve in life, the amount of money you have, everybody still has a fear of success and a fear of rejection. Even those top dogs, like even um, Chris Jenner has talked about it. I'm a big fan of the Kardashians, by the way. <laughs> and um, they're so... If you are thinking of doing something, push through. You will achieve it as long as you push through. Those fears, despite those fears, know that everybody has those fears. It's it's, it's normal almost. But um, you will stand out and you will achieve if you decide to push through. Awesome. Thank you once again. Please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And we look forward to your well thought out comments. And as usual, team. Refine. Unlock. Take take charge. charge. (laughs) Mandate.